Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Monday, March 14th hearing of uh, the Environment Committee. Uh, we are in yet another public hearing, just um, on the heels of one on Friday. And um, I, I don't know if everybody's having as much trouble getting going this morning as I am. That that hour loss of sleep is uh, it's amazing what it can do to you. So um, I uh, hope for a smooth hearing today. Uh, we'll look like we have a great agenda before us, and uh, it'll be interesting to hear from everybody. Just a couple of things, um, you know, before I turn it over um, for remarks from the rest of the leadership. Um, folks will have three minutes to testify today, um, and um, you know we have a, a hefty list of those signed up to testify. So just want everybody to be mindful of that as um, we ask questions, as committee members ask questions. Uh, we want to make sure that we can get to everybody on the list, and folks don't drop off um, because of other commitments. So just want to be mindful of that, but certainly want to. Uh, ask uh, questions and um, get as much information as we can to inform us on these legislative proposals as they move through the legislative process. Um, also just want to remind everybody um, who is signed up to testify that our fabulous clerk will be promoting you to a panelist. When it comes uh, close to your time to testify, you will just have to click the blue join button in order to be promoted and be heard um, in, in your testimony. So if we could just um, remember that to click that blue join button, that's helpful and allows for a smooth transition into um, the panel. All right, and with that, I believe my uh, house co-chair is in a, another public hearing testifying right now. We will find that throughout the day that all of us are balancing multiple public hearings and committee meetings as we are in a short session with condensed timelines. Um, so everybody is uh, trying their best to balance all of these meetings. Um, just know that if you are uh, testifying before us today and a member isn't here, that they are uh, reading the written testimony that's submitted and they hop back and forth um, and, and do their best to uh, be as present as they can in these meetings. So. Uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Senator Minor, uh, Ranking Member. Good morning, all. Um, <clears throat> happy to be here this morning uh, and listen to the testimony. I see the commissioner and deputy commissioner are uh, on the line, and I just like to remind them that we we're going to have a conversation about the uh, hazard tree issue on state parks and campgrounds, and I wasn't sure whether you folks were going to reach out to me or whether I was supposed to reach out to you, but I'd like to try and get back on track with that. I see head nodding, but I still am not sure what that means. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. Uh, ha happy to respond. We're happy to work with the committee on, uh, um, you know, co continuing discussion um, on the, uh, the race bill. And, and I'll also note, uh, uh, Tomorrow evening at six o'clock, um, we have a public meeting uh, scheduled um, as deep as uh, seeking input on our, our portion of this, uh, which would run in parallel in terms of um, developing uh, or enhancing our policy, developing our policy um, on hazard tree removal as well. So am I to contact you or are you folks going to reach out to me? Um, we're happy to, to reach out. All right. So. Hopefully that'll happen tomorrow. Thank you. Happy to have you both here. Thank you, Senator Minor. Uh, Representative Harding, any opening remarks from our- Just, uh, yeah, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I join Senator Minor and his, um, uh, his uh, looking forward to have a conversation on that issue as well. Um, it's very important. I'm sure, I know we're not the only ones in the committee that, that are looking forward to that conversation. Um, I look forward to a conversation on many bills today. Um, and I will say one of the benefits, many benefits of having a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old at home is that daylight savings time doesn't, doesn't mean as much. <laughs> and the loss of the hour of sleep doesn't mean as much. So that is one of the benefits. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Representative. Yes, I remember those years well, and we'll all be happy this evening, uh, you know, and as we were yesterday with the the uh, lighter, um, the longer day. All right, with that, uh, Commissioner, welcome. Good morning. Um, good morning, and uh, <clears throat> Senator Cohen and um, Senator uh, Miner, Representative Harding. Um, and met all the mem distinguished members of the committee appreciate the opportunity to appear before you again. I know you have an, a, uh, an exciting agenda of a, a range of bills. Um, I, I think, as you mentioned, um, <laughs> the um, com compacted schedule and, and, uh, and many different uh, hearings happening in sequence. I, I apologize that I believe our written testimony may not be filed yet. Um, as we've been uh, delighted to have the opportunity to submit written testimony on, on a lot of bills, but we're, we're starting to fall a bit behind. So I apologize um, personally for that. Uh, but I will just uh, just highlight um, that um, in our written testimony that will be submitted, uh, we've offered some suggestions on Senate Bill 244, which is an act concerning wildlife that causes damage to livestock, poultry, or bees. Um, our suggestions uh, particularly relate to um, some clarifications with respect to the disposition of any animals taken under the permit, where we would recommend um, to leave uh, the disposition to deep's discretion, um, uh, as in some cases we may uh, want um, to retain uh, the carcass for research purposes or other purposes. Um, and so this is just sort of a minor clarification that we're, we suggested on that bill. Um, with respect to House Bill um, 5293, which is an act pro prohibiting the use of wild or exotic animals in traveling animal acts, um, I'll, I'll note DEEP is deeply committed to the conservation of all wildlife, native and exotic. Um, we do have some questions or concerns uh, related to the proposed legislation with, from the administrative um, standpoint um, in terms of thinking through uh, as we're comparing uh, this bill um, to the requirements already in 26-55. Um, uh, uh, um, it is an expansion of responsibilities uh, for the department with some, um, uh, in our view, some, a significant increase in enforcement responsibilities. And so associated to that, uh, we would, we would um, anticipate uh, needing additional resources and able to uh, implement the responsibilities under this bill. So we would look forward to um, uh, working with the committee um, to uh, inform with respect to some of the resource uh, needs associated uh, if there were this um, bill uh, uh, were to be enacted. Um, we support House Bill 5294, which is an act concerning the intentional release of certain balloons, as we know that uh, we, we've, um, this contributes to, to litter problems that impacts negatively marine life and, and uh, uh, birds and other species. Um, and, but we did uh, in our written com uh, comments, uh, make some suggestions for some exemptions for um, weather balloons, for example. Um, House Bill 5296 is an act concerning the open space and watershed land acquisition program, which we support, as we understand this is reflected in and is consistent with the governor's um, budget. And then finally, House Bill 5297, an act concerning the multiplicity of affecting facilities in certain census block groups in the state. Um, DEEP strongly supports this bill. We appreciate the committee um, raising it, um, as the committee is aware, in December, Governor Lamont signed Executive Order 21-3, which directed DEEP to um, establish a council uh, on uh, equity and environmental justice, an advisory council um, within DEEP. We have uh, been working hard in, in uh, launching um, the CJAC, um, as we refer to it, the acronym. Uh, we have more than 50 people who have responded um, to uh, uh, either um, apply uh, to become members or to nominate someone to become a member. Um, we are, are looking to uh, identify and, and finalize the membership um, in the next uh, uh, two weeks, and we will have the first meeting of the CJAC at, um, on the 28th of March. Um, I believe that um, you know we're really excited about getting this advisory council started in part because we feel it will enable us um, um, uh, um, a, a, uh, to have a space um, to for for dialogue and engagement with environmental justice communities more directly um, to seek input and and, uh, and work on a collaborative basis um, to uh, consider 
uh, uh, ways to strengthen um, the state's environmental justice statute, among other things. So we appreciate um, the recognition of uh, the value that the CJAC can provide um, in uh, helping to advance recommendations to the committee uh, for strengthening the environmental justice statute. Um, and further in our written testimony, um, you'll see um, that DEEP also has been working on um, implementing uh, a <clears throat> with a grant uh, to UConn um, developing a, um, a, a tool um, that will help, uh, or a mapping tool um, to help us track pollution burdens, health disparities, and other vulnerabilities, um, including to the effects of climate change um, across communities in the state. And we think that that mapping tool will help us to develop a more fine-grained um, approach um, to the different types of, and the concentration of uh, impacts that are affecting communities across across the state that could also help to inform um, improvements to the state's environmental justice law. So with that, um, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee today. Sorry to go a little bit longer in summarizing um, our positions, but I wanted to have uh, make sure that those were at least summarized for the committee in advance of our written testimony being submitted. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, I appreciate that. I do see um, Representative Michelle has a question. Let me, uh, if I could, I, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions with respect to um, Senate Bill 244. Um, I, I was curious, is, is DEEP currently implementing the statute? Uh, do they issue permits uh, currently for the taking of wildlife? Yes, we do, although it is uh, pretty infrequent, less than a dozen. I think uh, instances per year where we um, get a request uh, to take an animal under this statute, um, you know, principally um, it's, uh, you know, coyotes or um, uh, raccoon, but let me, uh, but it, so it is fairly rarely utilized. Do you, um, it, is that because you aren't getting complaints of significant crop damage or just because you, What's the reason behind that? Mm -hmm. um, there's a significant, you know, I think there we just don't see that many requests in some years there's none, but let me invite um, Deputy Commissioner Trumbull or um, Jenny Dixon from our, our uh, wildlife division, if they can add. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, uh, Senator. I, I think the, the main reason uh, why we don't issue many permits for that is, is simply that we just don't see very many requests. Um, coming in underneath that specific program. We do have another program uh, under a different statute for deer where we do see more uh, requests coming under that uh, statute, but under this specific one, we really don't see very many. And, and for the program on, uh, with deer, are they, um, if, if uh, an animal is taken on the property, do they retain the carcass or is that turned over to deep? I know you mentioned that in your testimony. Do you want yeah. me to answer that one, Mason? Thank you, Jenny. No problem. Yes, Senator, with those, they are retained by the landowner, but there's also a much more formal procedure in place that aligns with how people deer hunt. So it much more closely parallels what we do with deer hunting. That's why that is really a separate statute in and of itself. And just, just, uh, because I don't know too much about deer hunting in Connecticut. I mean, it, it's legal. Why is that statute needed? Because there are limitations on how many deer you can harvest. And if a particular, say a particular corn farmer is having a lot of damage from deer, he may need to take things either out of season or may need to take things at a higher level than he's allowed to with the two permits he would be issued with his deer hunting license. Okay, do you, I, and I know this is sort of speculative, but do you um, believe that um, there aren't a lot of requests to, to implement this statute that we're talking about today because folks, the farmers just don't know about it? I think it's because there are some questions about applicability in some cases. They don't tend, we don't tend to see a lot of damage complaints come in for things like raccoon and coyote right now. We do get them occasionally. It's more situational based. A lot of times they're going to try non-lethal methods first. So I think there's a variety of reasons right now. 
is uh, the department getting complaints uh, about bears creating crop damage? We have been, yes. And the Department of Agriculture has received some complaints as well. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, I see Representative Michelle, you have a question for the department? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Dykes, uh, for your, uh, testifying today in front of us. I have questions on several bills. I will start with 244. Um, on SB 244, I was under the impression that the bill did not address deer, uh, but my, my main question to you is, if a, a farmer has an, what you guys call nuisance wildlife, which just does some uh, uh, destroying of uh, property, including livestock, then something that I completely myself personally disagree with, which is a death penalty for any animal for doing what is natural behavior on their side. But my question to you is, um, if a farmer can already get a permit to kill a bear, say a black bear on his property, or get a deep agent to come and kill the black bear that broke a fence or killed a chicken, uh, my question to you is, why would we need this bill? And again, it doesn't talk about deer, so I'm not sure where the conversation was really pointing to earlier about deer. And, you know, it's really, um, anyway, I'll, I'll let you answer that, that and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to move on to the other uh, bills, but I'll, we'll see what, what the answer is here. I mean, just briefly, I'll, I'll say that this is a committee bill. It's not a bill that was raised at Deep's request. So I, I can't speak to, perhaps speak to your question more directly there, but to the extent that you reference bear. I just want to indicate that we have, you know, been um, in consultation, or we have consulted the AG's office to understand whether um, bear could be taken under this provision. Um, and at this time, we it's it's not clear. <laughs> I appreciate that on 244. I think this bill is a loophole for someone to invite their friends to hunt on their properties. Uh, that's how I read the language uh, on 5293 House Bill 5293. Uh, the act prohibiting the use of wild and exotic animals. I think you mentioned that you had some questions on it. I didn't really see the 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 what the issues with uh, on lines. I think twenty six to fifty five. Can you elaborate on that, please? And and does does this bill take on the exotic pet trade? So I'll just start, and then perhaps uh, Jenny and, and Mason can add in. I think that we were just. Um, Again, reading uh, or comparing the language in, in this bill um, to the existing kind of requirements in terms of um, uh, under 26-55 uh, and considering, you know, from the standpoint of th this bill would expand uh, the type of enforcement responsibilities that the department would have. And so we, you know, from that perspective, um, we were, you know, just considering um, what types of resources we would need in terms of an expansion of, um, of resources within our INCON uh, unit um, to be able to manage the, um, the, the expanded enforcement responsibilities um, that DEEP would have under this provision. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, would, I, I will close on that bill uh, question with a statement that maybe we could use the uh, $2.6 million used for hit, uh, uh, hatcheries, fish hatcheries, which is not used for conservation and maybe use that there. Uh, on 5297, and that concerning the multiplicity of affecting facilities, the census block. So uh, you thank the committee for raising the bill. Uh, there were legislators that did request to raise a bill on environmental justice so that the main problem I, I think that's been uh, found with DEEP is that DEEP cannot or does not turn down a permit. So say, uh, uh, I'm a rock crusher and I want to come in the South End in Stanford and open an, a rock crushing uh, operation. Given there's rules that say now it's got to be in, indoors and all that stuff. But uh, for example, I have one with open doors. So there's dust flying out of there every day uh, and very little enforcement. Uh, my question to you is, why would we not this year, instead of having a study bill, why would we not try and take the main issue, which is the permitting issue, and address it? And there's been language proposed for that to fix the problem of permitting. 
I think this bill, what it's doing is we have CJAG that's led by DEEP, that's asked to make recommendations to DEEP, which I think sounds silly. And um, maybe if it was a more independent uh, um, body and um, if it was reporting to the legislature, then I would be actually supporting that language. But it doesn't fix the problem that we've had since a long time, but particularly since 2008, when we put EGA into statutes, environmental justice in our statutes, there, there hasn't been any protection for those communities. So they're already burdened with high pollution. And today, another polluting entity or an affecting facility could be coming in that same district and get permitted. Why don't we fix that? Why would you not be, why would you not be supporting language that is more effective in terms of it, uh, environmental justice and would actually uh, fix a problem rather than just let it continue to happen while we do a study of a group led by DEEP to be making recommendations to DEEP. Thank you, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, um, Representative Michelle. I'll, I'll say that you know we, uh, I believe as I read the bill that it does require the report to be provided to the legislature, not to DEEP. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, as we've looked at other states, including uh, New Jersey, for example, which I think has been a pace setter in terms of enhancing their environmental justice statute, um, they had, um, you know, the recommendations and, and a lot of the development of, of that um, uh, new approach uh, to their environmental justice statute emerged from the dialogue that occurred through um, their uh, an equivalent envir uh, environmental justice council that was established within the New Jersey DEP. And so um, that was sort of the, their, their um, uh, advisory council was sort of uh, the inspiration for us in, in terms of creating um, the CJAC. We think that, um, you know, th there's a lot of different issues that, that need to get worked through in order to, um, in order to develop a, a framework that it's going to be um, effective and, and protective and, and reflecting the needs of environmental justice communities. And I think we're committed um, to make this a top priority of, um, of the focus of the CJAC uh, to the extent that, uh, or at least from Deep's perspective. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 maybe I'll just, just stop there. I think we're all, you know, we, we shared the, the desire for some urgent enhancements to the environmental justice statute. Um, but respectfully, I think that uh, it would benefit us to have the time to work through some of those um, changes through the CJAC. Um, but I recognize we, we may be in a different place from you on, on that. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. I mean, I just find it odd that you'd be willing to delay any, any protection uh, or, or statutes, changes in the statutes that would actually establish protection for those communities, black and brown communities, mostly across the state from urban communities that are already uh, burdened with high pollution. I just don't understand why under the current um, and the current climate with uh, uh, the president mentioning, talking about environmental justice, our governor talking about environmental justice. Um, I just don't understand. And you said you, you're you, feel, you, you have the same feelings about uh, strengthening the statutes, but that's not happening this year. And we already know what the issues are. You even have mapping of environmental justice communities. So why delay with additional uh, research? But I appreciate it. I'm limited to one question per bill. So I will let my colleagues take on. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, and your team for being here with us this morning. I wanted to follow up on um, some of the questions that uh, Senator Cohn was asking about uh, SB 244, uh, particularly um, if there are only about a dozen requests under the nuisance wildlife um, statute currently, how many of those do you deny? I'll turn to uh, Jenny or Mason for that. We very rarely will deny them provided that they've provided the right documentation to us. So usually by the time they come to us, they've already tried a number of non-lethal methods to discourage the issue. They've already you know, tried a bunch of different things. So that's all documentation they have to provide to us before we issue the permit. By the time it reaches that stage, we rarely will deny them because they've already tried a lot of other things. So very seldom does that happen. 
Great, thank you. And and if I could also, I think commissioner, you suggested, and I'm not sure I understood you correctly, but about the, there's some question as to whether or not uh, bears can qualify as nuisance wildlife under that statute. Did I hear you correctly? That's right. We have um, we. I mean, just laying this provision against the um, other provisions of the general statutes. Um, you know, we, we've been, we've uh, engage the attorney general's office to get an opinion from them in terms of whether a uh, bear could be taken under this provision. And at that, at this point, as of the hearing this morning, um, we don't have a definitive uh, answer uh, from the AG's office on that question. Okay. I know I'm, I'm, I'm pushing the limit on, I'm curious whether then you've asked uh, whether people have requested to deal with bears as nuisance wildlife as part of those dozen requests, or is that not happening? Right now, people have not included bears in the in the request for nuisance wildlife. I think there's a lot of confusion on the part of people who are suffering depredation from bears on exactly how to address it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, and the good ranking member, Representative Harding. Thank you, Madam Chair. So following up on the, the same questioning that uh, you know, uh, Representative Hornet had um, in regards to um, the, the applications to, to, to DEEP, um, I, I'm assuming there's a, the reason why the proposal is before um, the legislature is because the, the current statutes at, as it's written does not allow for, for bear. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. So, 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 so no yeah. one would apply because it, the, the statute doesn't allow for it, correct? That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> or, I mean, so, that's our that's our under, that's our understanding why we haven't had a request. Um, but but despite that, you have had. Um, it, it, I think you had t t testified earlier that uh, you haven't had a number of um, uh, landowners contact you or farmers or whatever the case may be uh, in terms of. Uh, livestock being killed or injured or uh, crop damage, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We routinely get a number of complaints from people about livestock kills. That's, a, that's an increasing issue for us. We also have apiary issues. We have crop damage primarily to corn. So those are, those are probably the three big areas where we see it in terms of agriculture. Yeah, it's probably a question you can't answer. I'll ask it anyway. Uh, just to, to test, uh, test you. Not that you would know it, it, but do you have any idea, generally, uh, from from the reports you have had, the the amount of damage that we've seen? I think it varies on which area you're talking about. You know, we we had a lot of issues with livestock last year: um, sheep, pigs, goats, donkey. Um, you know, it it certainly rabbits and chickens too, but. You know, bigger livestock was certainly an issue. We've had corn damage in the neighborhood of you know eight or ten acres at a time will be reported by a farmer. I think right now they tend not to track that as much. USDA hears about that a little bit more than we do because they're not sure how they should handle it. And, and final question. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm probably asking a little too too much, and I apologize. It's one. Is there a, is there an area of the state that, that you're noticing you're seeing a lot of this? It really does happen almost everywhere. You know, we we have bear across the state right now. I think everybody tends to think it's just the northwest corner, but it's actually much more distributed than that. Okay. Thank you for your help and your expertise on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Gresko, my co-chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just want to follow up on um, State, uh, Representative Harding's uh, questioning. Uh, in the current statute, is there a specific definition of damage uh, and what that would entail? Uh, I know that um, there are examples of livestock being taken and uh, acres being um, uh, ruined. But uh, I'm wondering if um, if we can uh, if the, the the definition of of damage is in the existing uh, statute, so that we can um, better clarify this. And where I'm going with that is that uh, you know if a bear just happens to walk through my my cornfield, that doesn't give me 
the uh, the 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 ability to, to issue it a complaint and and you know run out there and, and try to to shoot it. So um, I'm I'm trying to get a, a handle on a, a parameter here. Yes, Representative, thank you uh, for that. Just just so I understand understand your question is what is the definition of uh, what's included under the agricultural definition? Is that correct? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, one of the uh, statements that was made by Representative Michelle earlier was that, you know, they're, they're going to have a, a group of people just wait for um, um, a specifically targeted animal to wander into their uh, uh, property and then and then, you know, potentially fatally wounded because they said, oh, it was it was going to move through my cornfield and it was going to eat the corn. So I wanted to stop. Is there is there a technical definition of, of damage? Uh, yes, Representative. I'd like to ask uh, Allison Rao uh, to provide a little bit more clarity on um, what the current statute says, and, and then how these pro these pro the proposed additions uh, may affect that. Allison. Yep, definitely. Um, Allison Rao, um, Environmental um, Conservation Branch Office Legal Director. Uh, the definition in um, in Section twenty six dash forty seven defines. Um, where wildlife is causing unreasonable damage to agricultural crops. So that's that, that's the term that's currently in statute here. Um, and then with regard to the um, sections that, that I think have been asked about um, that that may be causing that may be causing conflict with regard to bears more specifically, um, the the conflicts that we see here are with um, statute twenty six dash eighty a, and then also with regulations um, sections twenty six dash sixty six three and twenty six dash sixty six seven. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep yeah, it to the to, maybe perhaps directly to your question, Representative Gresco, the agricultural damage would have to be documented. And in practice, we would require that uh, non-lethal methods are attempted. Um, prior to providing an authorization under this provision. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, as I was saying, I'm gonna to stick to the one question. So, cause we've got quite a few people queued up behind me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative and the ranking member, Senator Minor. Thank you, Madam Chair. So <clears throat> staying on the same subject, same bill, the, the effort here is to try and provide a pathway for people that earn their living in agriculture to deal with what is been well documented in the agency, um, despite the confusion today, well documented. Um, and I know we're gonna head to another summer, another fall, more phone calls, more livestock um, being killed or damaged if this isn't the pathway, what the committee seeks is, is a pathway. And to have people within the agency say, we haven't really had many requests here, or the paperwork hasn't been filled out correctly, um, doesn't really help us, I think, get to where we're trying to go. Um, I know AP areas, beekeepers. I know people that have corn. Um, my constituents have livestock. Every single one of those categories has been impacted by some form of wildlife at times. And these people generally live in harmony with wildlife. It's not like they spend every waking minute thinking about um, what they can take the life of. So they're looking for some guidance and some tools. They're also making me aware that when they call the numbers, there may be a recording. There's seldom someone that goes out after hours or on a weekend. The first question is, is the bear still there or is the coyote still there? You name it. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a, a solution so that we People can demonstrate to the agency that they've made a good faith effort, but it just seems like at every turn, um, it's too much of a hot potato and they're left with the expense. They're left with burying the horse or the donkey. 
Um, so is this not the right statute for the committee to be looking at? And would there not, under the way it's been drafted, a level of responsibility for the applicant and the agency to determine whether or not the incident fits? So that's a question. Great, thank you, Senator. Just respectfully, I think what we are trying to bring to the committee's attention is that there is there could be a potential legal conflict in issuing bears issuing permits under 26-47 for bears um, that could result in potential legal challenges as it potentially conflicts with the stat with 26-80A and the regs that prohibit open hunting and trapping seasons for bear. So to the extent that um, you know, this provision could be utilized to address uh, 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 agricultural damage associated with bears, we're simply bringing to the committee's attention that further clarification in the bill would be helpful with respect to bears to ensure that, um, that, that, there, that further legal challenges or, or conflicts wouldn't arise um, in implementing the bill so that it could achieve the, the committee's goals. And with respect to other wildlife, that same problem does not exist because there are other statutes that include all those other species um, in a way that allows for the taking of those animals. Is that, is that correct? That's, that's correct. We don't see the similar types of conflicting language in other parts of, of statute or regulation, but we'd be happy to work with the committee and um, perhaps also we could bring the AG's office into the um, conversation to ensure that um, the intent here, if it's to allow for um, the authorization to take bears under this provision um, is reflected with clarifying language to ensure that there wouldn't be th those types of co conflicts arising in, in the implementation. No, yeah, there, there just aren't other provisions of statute or regulation that uh, prohibit the take for other species as clearly as they do for bears. I, I understand. And, and I think uh, if I were an attorney, which I'm not, I would be arguing that this is not hunting. This is protecting um, an inventory uh, of agriculture and it's not hunting. So, all right, well, I. Uh, I'm not sure what the likelihood is that we would have a continuing conversation, but I, I certainly would welcome it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Minor. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, staying on this same bill, uh, I was listening to Jenny Dixon's uh, explanation of the process uh, before a permit is issued. And um, I just wanted to, uh, so there's a list of requirements if, if, if I understand uh, correctly. In other words, um, what the preliminary um, and filling out the documentation, you mentioned a list of documentation. Um, is, is that a defined list? It's, it's part of our official process right now, representative. So that's, you know, that's sort of our, I don't know if I want to call it an internal checklist, but those are the questions that we look at when somebody's making an application. Okay, so, so reading into that, um, is there anything in there specifically uh, that addresses the involvement of an econ officer? In other words, if, if I have a bear who's coming into my yard all the time, uh, there's a report online that that the homeowner can fill out uh, and report to deep the uh, the nuisance bear, and then uh, I guess often uh, as uh, man or personnel, woman power, or whatever uh, involved with the uh, assignment of an officer to come out, uh, that officer would investigate the situation, and then sometimes uh, and oftentimes they tag the they tag the animal, and then if it happens again, the other ear gets a tag. So, am I am I hearing then that the farmer who's having this crop damage or this um, livestock damage uh, has probably had the involvement of an econ officer? 
Uh, Representative Mason Trumbull, thank you uh, for your question. Uh, I can talk a little bit about our our NCON officers and and our response and how we um, how we uh, approach uh, nuisance bears or problem bears. Um, we do have you know very strict uh, protocols on how we address those, uh, and and that extends far beyond just agricultural damage. Obviously, uh, there's been reports of bears getting into uh, structures and homes and, and things of that nature as well. So. Uh, our ANCON officers do respond uh, to calls. Um, usually they do so on a first responder uh, basis. So it, as Senator Meyer said, if the bear is present and causing uh, danger, that's that's an area where we would uh, go to uh, respond on a first responder type uh, uh, basis. Uh, if the bear is not there, uh, there's oftentimes very little our ANCON officers can do uh, in, in the moment. However, our wildlife division does uh, at, at times uh, we'll go and try to um, set a trap or something of that nature uh, to either um, scare the bear uh, away using uh, different techniques or, or other methods as well. So relocating the bear, et cetera. So um, there's kind of two ways to respond. One with our anchor officers being the first responder if there's a present danger and then our wildlife team responds uh, if there's uh, more of a continuing uh, issue. Maybe the bear isn't there right now, but it's, it's come back and they they are able to go and, and offer a response uh, if necessary. So um, thank, thank you for the explanation. Um, it just, I guess it didn't get to the exact answer that I was looking for. What, what, uh, what I was looking for is affirmation that um, uh, an NCON officer is involved that, and, and it, most likely is part of the documentation uh, of the landowner, the farmer, um, and and they they know the history, and and it would seem to me it, 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 the the justifiable answer for uh, what Miss Dixon said was the permit is normally issued because all this has been dealt with prior to asking for the permit to um, take action against. Uh, the bear. Um, and I just wanted to uh, kind of affirm um, that that's the process and therefore, therefore the justification is, is uh, pretty well known. Sure, yes, Representative. Representative, sorry, sorry, Mason. Yeah, certainly they're going to either have dealt with an NCON officer, you know, either calling dispatch and, and filing a complaint with dispatch having an officer respond or contacting the wildlife division and talking to one of our biologists or a member of our bear team about that. So there are multiple points of contact where they can make that complaint lodged and have a response start to be tracked for that individual incident. All right, thank you. Thank you so very much. And um, Madam Chair, we're really only allowed one question or is it one question at a time? No, no, I just ask that the committee be concise. Oh, could, could I ask one other question on another bill? Please do. Thank you very much. And this is for Commissioner Dykes and um, Katie, good to see you. Good I, to see you. I, I just, um, I feel so bad that we're all doing this by Zoom. I'd love to be in the room. Um, <laughs> I agree. Know, shake, shake your hand and so forth. I want to go back to 5294 on the balloons. And um, my recollection is that it was maybe two sessions ago that we had already passed a bill. And the, the only difference between this bill and the prior bill was the number of balloons that trigger um, the violation. And, and I said at that time, and I'm gonna say it again for the record, um, or first I'll ask the question, what is the method of enforcement? So let me uh, invite our team to respond on, on that particular question. Uh, yes, Representative, I can, uh, I'll do my best to answer your question on this one. Uh, we do oftentimes get requests uh, from folks who are um, maybe celebrating uh, uh, the, the passing of a loved one or something along that nature to do uh, releases of balloons in like a state park or something like that. Um, uh, and so we have, uh, you know, held a line on uh, 10 um, balloons. That being said, as you can imagine, uh, it is very difficult to enforce if we don't if we don't get a specific request for it to, to be on site uh, when those balloons are released is incredibly difficult to manage uh, from from a enforcement perspective. Right. So that's that's the same answer that we dealt with 
uh, on passage of the, the last bill, the prior bill. Um, and, and if I recall right, is the fine $35? To be honest, the representative, I, I don't have a good answer for that. If uh, Colonel List, do you have that off the top of your head? If not, we're happy to, to get back to you, a representative on what the fine is. Okay, so I'm going to presume my memory is pretty good, even though it's 75 years old, um, that the $35 is the amount. And, and I'm going to say it again. Um, we put legislation on the books all the time, all kinds of legislation that is never enforced. I mean, first of all, you've got to either have some state officer, policeman, uh, econ officer, somebody witness the event and or I guess somebody report it um, and then be able to prove it. Um, and it this is going to go nowhere because the last time that we put this in effect, I have still seen pictures on Facebook of many balloon releases. People, people release these balloons for, for whatever their reasons are. Um, and honestly, I don't care. But if you don't have enforcement, you're never going to reduce the problem. And my recommendation last time, and I'll say it again this time for enforcement is, give a reward. If you see something, say something. If it's a $35 fine, give half the fine to the reporter and you'll get some action. And so let's, if we're going to, if we're going to write this bill, let's make it have some teeth in it. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'll just say, um, Representative, you know, I think this is one, is, uh, not, not a, a direct comment, but I, I will say, you know, this covers intentional releases. And I think that there are circumstances where, where I've seen, and, and obviously our enforcement uh, resources are, are, are limited. Um, but I think having the, the current program on the books has, you know, causes folks, sometimes we see, you know, someone planning a, an event, you know, of sharing it on social media with an intentional balloon release. Um, and then others will flag and say, hey, that's not allowed you know, that here's the statute that prohibits it. If we didn't have that statutory framework in place, um, others would not have have reason to, to speak up and, and, and um, indicate, you know, that, that um, uh, the, the, the concerns with, with the practice. So in some cases, I think um, the public, you know, does play a role in, in referring folks too deep um, or pointing to these uh, regulations, pointing to these requirements. And, and certainly those instances also are an opportunity to share public awareness about why we have these provisions on place and how the you know, balloon releases can be, can be harmful. But um, I uh, appreciate your comments in, in terms of thinking about uh, how to enhance uh, enforcement. And thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, I just, uh, I feel this way about a lot of our legislation has no teeth um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Hennessy. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, I would be uh, following Representative uh, uh, Wilson's comments about no teeth. I would like to associate my comments with uh, Representative uh, Michelle, uh, regarding the environmental justice bill. Uh, as a pro principal proponent of the uh, environmental justice bill back in 2008, it would be remiss of me not to, uh, not to uh, include my voice in an effort to strengthen the existing uh, bill. It, it's, uh, it was the first in the nation. Uh, since then, many states have uh, created their own environmental justice uh, laws. Uh, and uh, I, can, I can say that uh, when I was working on this bill, I was uh, interested that um, I didn't get much pushback from the, uh, the uh, companies, agencies that would be, uh, it would be affecting. And, um, you know, years later, now I realize that uh, the reason why is because uh, the, the bill, base, the law is basically a paper tiger. 
Uh, and uh, there are members in the legislature that would like to uh, put some teeth into it uh, rather than just uh, kick it on down the road as a study. Um, the, the pandemic has shown that the communities uh, that, that are in uh, distress um, are not protected by government. And, uh, you know, some idealists might have thought that this was a potential opportunity to address these uh, issues that the, uh, that the uh, horrible pandemic has uh, uh, foisted on, uh, on uh, poor communities. Uh, so this is this is one area that uh, you know Connecticut likes to think of itself as a leader in the nation. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, falling behind in environmental justice, uh, and I would I would really like to see this bill, um, this law. Um, you know, as uh, Representative Wilson uh, said, you know, actually be enforced and uh, be strengthened. Thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, Chair. Thank you, Representative, uh, and my co-chair, Representative Fresco. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, since this is my second uh, go around, I would defer to Representative Palm, then Mashinsky. Absolutely, we'll come back to you. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, Representative Palm. Thank you, Representative Gresco um, and Senator. Uh, good morning, everybody at Deep. I have a, well, very quickly, I would like to also just for the record say, I think our environmental justice bill needs to be strengthened enormously. Uh, I don't really have a question for you, Commissioner, about it, but I do want that on the record that I think we need to do a much stronger bill at some point. Um, my question has to do with uh, Senate Bill 244. And please forgive me if this sounds naive, but if the purpose of this bill is twofold, one, on the one hand, to protect farmers, livestock and crops from damage, predominantly from bears, as we're discussing, on the one hand, and on the other, for wildlife advocates who believe in bears as, you know, essentially gentle wild creatures, is there not a way for a farmer to do something in between ignoring it and killing it. I'm not talking about, you know, an old fashioned dart blow gun, although that would be cool. Is there <laughs> a thing as a, as a stun gun that could knock the bear out for several hours and then allow deep to come and dispose of it humanely, bring it back into the wild. I, I, I understand that, you know, arms need training and, and it's a different kind of but have we as a as a group of people who would like to solve this problem have we given any thought to allowing farmers with some sort of an appropriate permit to fire something that knocks them out um without harming them and killing them and then allowing deep to swoop in and do its good work thank you thank you representative um Yes, you know, there are methods in between uh, the two you, you outlined. Um, those adversive conditioning methods uh, are methods our wildlife biologists often employ, um, and, and they involve, you know, trapping the bear in a large metal drum and, uh, you know, scaring it with noise, uh, air horns, and, and things of that nature, or even, uh, like you said, uh, you mentioned a stun gun of some sort, bean bag, something like that that will cause some. Um, you know, temporary uh, pain and discomfort for the animal that will hopefully associate uh, people or food coming from uh, humans uh, as something to stay away from in the future. Um, so yes, there, there are some of those methods and normally those are conducted by either like a nuisance wildlife operator or our wildlife biologists. Um, those type of methods are not normally something that just uh, easily, easily achieved through um, members of the general public, although air horns you know, certainly are something that, that have uh, limited uh, use. Um, Jenny Dixon, would you like to talk a little bit more about some of those adversive conditioning methods that we, uh, that we use as an agency? Sure, absolutely. Mason, you touched on a number of them. And certainly for an individual landowner, one thing that is very successful is electric fencing. That's something that we recommend repeatedly. You know, it does provide much like much like the shock collars people will use on other animals, it does provide that little jolt of, hey, you're not supposed to do this. 
So that, that is one method that's been particularly successful for things like apiaries. There are a lot of other things that we can recommend in terms of securing your livestock, for example, that do help. Some of the methods that we employ, in addition to what Mason has mentioned, you know, we will also use the beanbag rounds. We've used paintball guns. So a lot of things that make noise provide some unpleasant association with people. Those will help, but it depends on the level of habituation of bears in many cases. How, how accustomed have they gotten to being around people? So that can make it increasingly difficult. If we're talking about other agricultural damage, things like you know crop damage to corn, that's gonna be really complicated for a farmer to address because they can't effectively put, you know, put electric fencing up around a 50 or 100 acre cornfield. So it, I think there are certain things you can try in certain instances, and those are just a handful of the things that we do try. But yeah, those are the kinds of things that we're always gonna to wanna to try and do first. Well, I, I do understand um, that, but in the panoply of all the different methods that you mentioned, I think they are onerous on farmers. Um, and I don't think we want farmers trying to wrestle a bear into a tank. Oh, I'm talking yeah, correct. about a thing that they can shoot. We're talking about people who want to be able to shoot. Let's just cut to the chase. Um, is there a thing they could shoot into the bear that would knock it out until you can arrive with your tank, with your methodology. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go on record saying I think farmers should bear the extra burden of fencing in their farms or or having to, you know, run around banging tin cans. I I, I think really we're we're talking about people. If if the point of this bill is to prevent to close a loophole so that there is no excuse for killing bears for those people who want to kill a bear for the sake of killing a bear or for stuffing it and, and, and having it as a trophy, then let's make it easy on the farmer and let's do something that is humane, but is not an extraordinary burden. And so my question really is, is there a way to shoot them safely, which would, which would obviate the argument, well, I had no choice but to shoot it, therefore kill it, therefore, oh, now it's hanging on my wall. How convenient. I'm talking about protecting the livestock, protecting the donkeys. I had a constituent whose, whose donkeys were attacked in, my, in one of the towns I represent. I do think it's a problem, but there has to be a humane way to, to, to stun it or you know, knock it out, anesthetize it um, without a, a enormous expense or training. That's really my question. Representative, I think the challenge becomes when you're dealing with an animal as large as a bear, to do something that would anesthetize it is, is, would require high regulation in terms of the compounds used because if they were used inappropriately, you could, you could severely injure a human. So, you know, there's, there's that concern. Those compounds are highly regulated. So it requires, you know, veterinary permissions and a significant amount of training to utilize tranquilizer drugs, for example. Something like a stun gun would not be effective on a black bear. So those are, you know, those are some of the things that I think we commonly think of. In this kind of situation, that would absolutely just not be effective, unfortunately. Oh, okay, thank, thank you for that distinction. Um, but, I, you know, just, I think it's important to point out that guns take training and regulation and are lethal and can kill people if used incorrectly as well. So presuming these people are responsible gun owners, I don't know why it's a huge leap for them to learn how to use a tranquilizer, but I don't, I don't know enough about armaments to, to push on that. I was really just raising it as a humane, reasonable um, mid, mid ground. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Mashinsky. There it goes. <laughs> One of my constituents has a uh, non-lethal method of bear control, which uh, she would like to bring to the market. Uh, she raises, she um, trains Karelian bear dogs, and they they go out and they harass bears and chase them away from a property. And I, I assume that we'd have to change the statutes in order to let her. Uh, create that business and to let her bring her trained bear dogs to a property to harass the bears. Uh, is that correct? It's a non-lethal method of bear control. 
Yes, Representative, that is correct. We would need to we would need to change some things around to allow her to be able to do that. I think the other challenge that we have, the, the Corolling Bear Dogs have been uh -huh. shown to be very effective when they've been used out west. I think we would rapidly find that the demand probably exceeded supply. So, you know, it, it would be a it would be a limited solution initially, might have longer term benefits and you know is certainly something that that we've been looking at closely. Okay, well, um, my constituent is enthusiastic about this, and I wondered what you would think if I were to put an amendment in uh, one of the DEP bills to uh, allow this to take place in Connecticut. I think we have to look at the language. I would say we're not we're not necessarily opposed right right off the start, but we'd want to see what the language looks like. Okay, well, all right, I'll talk to her and then uh, send you some language and see what you think. I like the idea because it's non-lethal and apparently works pretty well. So uh, I wanted to give her a try. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Thank you Representative. Here. Thank you so much. I, you know, I, I know when we had our non-lethal uh, methods of deterring black bear bill, we talked a lot about um, the implementation of bear dogs. So it's an interesting thought. Um, I just wanna remind all members that they could please uh, put themselves on mute when they are not talking. That will help tremendously uh, with feedback and whatnot. Uh, Representative Michelle for the second time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um... I'll have a question on SB237, but prior to that, I'll make a quick comment, uh, uh, just a, a follow-up on the S244. Um, you know, we hear, again, I'll, I'll, I'll stress the fact that I don't think that, I don't believe that death penalty and uh, Re Representative Palm was making a case there, but the, I don't think the death penalty is really something for natural behavior. And I wonder how much damage they would make really to a crop. What does one black bear do in terms of damage to a crop? Uh, is there another way to get the farmer recompensated for uh, nature or for wildlife to do its natural behavior? I, I just wonder. And, and, and then we've heard of, uh, you know, uh, from Mr. Trumbull that, uh, you know, there's a strict uh, protocol uh, to get a kill order, but yet we do hear about mothers being killed, uh, leaving the cubs in the hands of, uh, of humans. And, and, you know, some ACO was also uh, found to have been feeding black bears for a very long time and then happened to be on camera harassing a bear that she had, well, in, in, in what was brought up to me, she didn't have proof that that was the nuisance bear and beating on a drum with the bear inside like way, uh, like a good amount of time after some damage was done. And so I, I, I do think that there's a lot more to discuss on this uh, way before, uh, uh, and we should not really consider any kill orders uh, for, uh, those, for those animals that maintain uh, our soil health in the forests. There are keystone species, black bears are a keystone species, and we need them. And we don't have like actual uh, proper old lifelong bear scientists or like some of the top scientists that I've had communications with absolutely have no understanding of where we're trying to go in Connecticut with black bears. But anyway, so I'll go to Senate Bill 237, an act concerning the funding of fish hatcheries. So I have made some requests from uh, uh, through DEEP uh, from ILR on how much money is being used out of the fish hatcheries for um, uh, habitat restoration or, or, or for game or for, for, for fishing. So how much of our tax base money is being used for uh, deep to hatch fish to get fished? Um, and, and I'll put, uh, I'll, I'll talk about another detail that came through a bill last year that I, I found really strange. Um, I did not get a precise answer through LR from deep on the money. Actually a fiscal analysis sent me some numbers but they could not answer the, the question that was asked that only DEEP could answer. And the answer from the DEEP side was basically uh, that they wanted to know in what context the question came uh, and did not respond. So I I was kind of disturbed by that. But let's, let's talk about the hatcheries. It was also further answered in another email by Peter, I think, Harrestad, that 
that money was primarily used for really for gains, for fishing. So we're using right now $2.6 million or 2.1 million. It's an average since 2017 of $2.1 million. $1 million for salary and wages, a third of a million dollars for electricity, a quarter million dollars for temporary uh, salaries and wages, and a quarter million dollars for equipment. So that's 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 almost two point two almost two point two million out of the two point one million dollars, and I sure would like to know why we would raise that to four million dollars, and if my understanding is correct, last year we passed a bill on invasive species plants, <laughs> and some language was added after the fact that was basically like allowing deep to hatch fish all year long of a, a, a species of trout that is non-native without any uh, environmental impact survey as what does it do that we like, what impact does it have on the river to put an, a species that is non-native all year long for the pleasure of fishermen, which I'm happy everybody being happy, but this is really strange. And I'm thinking that the, ex the expense, the increase in the expense could be linked to that passage of that bill last year that I voted on, but I, I have to admit, I made a mistake on voting on that bill. But um, so I'm trying to understand what this bill does and why would we put more taxpayers money into hatching fish that are invasive species or for the gains when we have so much more to do for the environment in Connecticut in terms of conservation. And so, oh, sorry. Thank you. Is that the, you know, there's a number of questions in there, but I'll just start, you know, Representative Michelle, that this, um, this bill 237 is not um, an agency bill. Um, so it's not it raised at the agency's request um, to the extent that it's, it's not consistent with the funding for fish hatcheries that's uh, uh, included in the governor's budget, I think we would defer to, to OPM and, um, you know, in, uh, in terms of uh, this bill, but, but it's not um, consistent with the governor's budget proposal. But that said, um, we're very, you know, proud of the, of the work that we do um, through our, uh, with our fish hatcheries and to being able to support um, a lot of economic development and outdoor recreation uh, uh, for the public um, associated with uh, fishing in, in our state. We have some incredible fisheries in our state and uh, the work of the fish hatcheries really assists with that. In addition, um, as part of the uh, Executive Order 1, the Greener Gov Initiative, we've been um, uh, in working on uh, some really exciting projects um, to help improve the uh, and, and reduce the energy use. Um, associated with our with our hatcheries, so we're really excited um, about that that work, which is uh, going to enable us to continue to deliver on this mission, um, hopefully at a, a lower operating cost uh, for taxpayers. Um, and then uh, I'll do, I'll refer to uh, Deputy Commissioner Trumbull as well to talk about um, some of the additional work that we're doing with fisheries. Uh, yes, Representative, uh, thank you for your question. So to, to talk specifically about um, you know how we use the hatcheries to, to fund habitat. Um, you know, the hatchery fund obviously supports the hatcheries um, uh, specifically, but um, you know, some of those, some of the fish we grow in the hatcheries are used for uh, what we call put and take fish uh, fishing, uh, which means, you know, we stock the fish, the fish get caught throughout the season. And um, then other parts of the uh, hatchery system we use to um, create wild trout populations. So, um, focusing on rivers that can support and ecosystems that can support wild trout populations and how do we uh, promote um, native and wild trouts using our hatchery system. So um, there's kind of two different, uh, which obviously supports all of that goes to support our uh, very robust recreational uh, fishing uh, scene here in Connecticut and uh, the economic impacts that are part of that. Thank you, Mrs. Trumbull. Uh, but, but the answer from Deep which was vague, but it was saying that the majority of that fund is, or the hatcheries is used for game. When you're like, what I'm saying is where, do you know, does Deep know what the impact is of maintaining a non-native species of fish in a river all year long? Do we have anything about this? Uh, yes, Representative Michelle, we have a wild trout management plan here in Connecticut. We're actually working on another one right now. 
Um, so that's that's something that we take uh, very seriously in making sure that we, st we stock, uh, obviously, to promote uh, that robust fishery that we have here in Connecticut, uh, but doing so in a way that is uh, very, uh, making sure that we're doing so in a way that supports the native uh, ecosystems as well. Right. So, so there, there is no, or there is an uh, an actual study of the impact of maintaining this in the non-native species of trout in the rivers of Connecticut. We have an actual study of this. Uh, yes, we, you know, we we take research from many different uh, sources in our wild trout management plan. I'm happy to to share that with you and the members of the committee as well. Yeah, thank you. I look for peer-reviewed studies. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative, and over to my co-chair, Representative Brasco. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to uh, uh, wrap it up here uh, with uh, continuing the line of questioning from Senator Minor on um, 244, um, I would uh, be interested in the result of, uh, of the conversation with the Attorney General's office. I am not an attorney either, but uh, uh, in a legal opinion that I trust implicitly, is telling me that uh, 2680A is not in conflict with this potential statute. Moreover, um, regulations are trumped by statutory provisions, so that wouldn't be a conflict either. And then I'll leave the last sentence out of our conversation there, but um, uh, I would be interested to see uh, what the result is uh, going forward. So, so thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Representative, and, and thank you, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, and uh, our Bureau Chief there of Wildlife Management, uh, Jenny Dixon. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Thank you all. Um, okay, next we have Representative Irene Haynes. I think I saw her. Representative Haynes, are you with us still? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, sorry. I'm in between meetings as well. Um, but I thank you very much. I'd like to put my um, testimony in support of HB 5294. Thank you to the ranking members and the uh, chair and vice chairs. Um, you've been hearing about this bill from me since 2019. I've submitted testimony, so I'm not going to go through that. And You have a very busy schedule. But a couple of items that I wanted to just tell you about and brief you guys on in regards to some new things that have come up since 2019. Um, I was speaking to hay farmers. This is a whole new group of people who have expressed their concerns in regards to these balloons because the balloons get caught up in the, in the, uh, in the grasses and actually corn as well. And they get caught up in the machineries to, um, you know, when they do their harvesting and even in hay bales. And then it's then fed to the farm animals not even realizing there's a mylar balloon in the, uh, the actual hay until it's, you know, too late and already ingested. Um, so farm animals are, um, you know, subject to this mess. Um, and finally, the South Fork Natural, Mu Natural History Museum Shark Resource and Education Program is also shedding light on the issue of balloon pollution by holding an annual Balloons for Sharks tournament. They used to hold a sharks tournament, but instead of that, they are now for the last two years and they've invited Connecticut to join them for the entire state of, of New Jer or, I'm sorry, of New York. They are running a tournament in July to collect helium balloons. Last year, they collected 1300 balloons. The winner himself collected 707 of them and won the tournament. This is the kind of mess that we're letting go and not doing something about. Even though we do have a law in the books that says less than 10% or less than 10 balloons is okay. So we've got to stop this. We've got to do something here. We understand that it's, you know, it's a littering issue. We've, we've implemented littering and recycling laws, which have has a positive impact on our environment. Recently, a law was passed in Connecticut to eliminate the use of plastic bags. Following this pattern of awareness, it is my hope that a law can be passed in Connecticut prohibiting the release of all balloons. This session, thank you so much I appreciate that the Environment Committee brought my bill up again this year. Thank you so much. You'll hear from all kinds of people again today in regards to this bill. I appreciate the support. Thank you so much, Representative Haynes. And I, I completely agree with you. You know, I go out frequently for cleanups and um, am collecting mylar balloons from our waterways and from our forests, and it's really disheartening. I just wonder, though, 
Um, you gave an example of uh, why we need this law, but we do have a law on the books. Um, and, you know, in keeping with what Representative Wilson uh, mentioned before, and I, I'm not sure if you heard uh, his line of questioning to the DEP on this bill, um, but what, what makes you think that us doing this would make any difference? Um, because, you know, we're still seeing these intentional releases. That's a great question. Thank you, Senator Cohn. Um, I did hear um, Rep. Wilson's uh, testimony, and I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that we tried to do last year when we brought the bill forward is I was actually working with a group of Girl Scouts who suggested some um, things that we can do on a awareness campaign. Um, the bottom line is, is that because they can still be released, people are still saying, okay, I'll release three, I'll release four. But you can clearly hear from, and the cries from people today of this, of still the, the big mess that we have and the amount of balloons that are being collected. Again, in a, a shark tournament, they come up with almost 1300 balloons. Um, I think that we obviously need to um, look further into awareness campaigns, maybe working with DEEP, working with our Girl Scouts and our Boy Scouts, and, and, and start, you know, a campaign for just awareness, which um, is certainly, uh, you know, no question that once that more awareness comes out there, people will realize that this is just a bad thing. And people are talking to each other. You know, somebody had mentioned already this morning that somebody had said to somebody else, you can't be doing that. Um, so I think just the more attention that this is brought, you know, brings forward. And I think the actual prohibition of all release of balloons is, is a big piece to that awareness and that start of that awareness. So I think, you know, we definitely have some work to do. Can we, can we find people more than $35? I don't know if that's gonna do it. I think a bigger um, awareness piece, maybe adding some information to the kiosks at state parks that say, you know, no, um, you know, no littering, which is all out there. We can add no release of balloons. Uh, you know, it's, it might be just as simple as adding a little bit of phrase to all the literary um, all the, uh, you know, um, literature that's out there regarding, you know, littering and, and all of that. Um, could you be fined as much as you are for, um, can balloons be included in the littering fines? Absolutely. Why not? It's still garbage. It goes in the air, it comes back. It's still garbage. So I think we can, we can look at those items. Maybe we can make an amendment to the bill in regards to that. But I think ultimately just a total prohibition of releasing balloons is a big step toward making that awareness possible. Great, thank you, Representative. And I see uh, my co-chair, Representative Fresco, has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Haynes. It's been a pleasure working on this uh, with you over the last few years. And I would, um, uh, as I've said, I'm not an attorney, so at the risk of drawing the ire of, uh, of the legal mind that I just referenced, but I'm um, thinking that, um, what about uh, a language in the bill that would require individuals that do sell balloons to have a notice posted um, where they're selling them uh, with the with the general statute uh, that we pass uh, indicating that, oh, by the way, I'm buying these balloons and and uh, maybe the the law being referenced there would be um, a deterrent. Um, I'm I'm interested in how you feel about that. You know, I Thank you, Representative Gresco, and a particular thank you to you, because I know that you were instrumental in bringing this bill forth this year. Um, yes, I think that's a great idea. And I also think that there are a number of organizations out there that are looking to absolutely ban this altogether. We haven't even talked this year yet, mentioning about the fact that helium is a limited um, element in the universe that we need for medical purposes. So really, ultimately, the idea would to get rid of helium filled balloons altogether, but we're not going there. There is uh, a lot of work being done by the balloon lobbyists to crush this bill because of that reason, because we don't want, they don't want bills, I mean, they don't want balloons banned. So maybe that would be a great compromise for the balloon industry and us to work together in, in, in solving the problem at hand, which is this trash issue and the, and the detriment that it is to machinery, infrastructure, people, animals, the works. So I love that idea. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Gresco. Uh, Representative Mishinsky. Uh, hi, Representative uh, Haynes. I'm glad you're here again. Um, I wanted to let you know, I wrote the original law, and the reason it says 10 in there is that the lobbyists 
had had enough of the committee convinced to vote no that I had to agree to the number 10. Um, but actually it should be zero. And uh, originally the bill was done. I did worked with a bunch of uh, students to pass it and it was done to protect sea life because um, a number of species eat the balloons. They think they're jellyfish and then it uh, clogs up their intestines and they starve to death slowly. Um, plus it's a real pain in the butt to uh, clean them up on the uh, beaches as you have already mentioned. So that's the only reason for that 10 is that I had to put that in to get it out of committee. Uh, but it should be zero. It's uh, whether it's whether it's one, two, three, four, or five, still the same damage to the to the environment. And uh, zero is what we should strive for. So I'm glad you put the bill in. Greatly appreciate it. And hopefully this will be the year it finally goes through both chambers. Um, thank you. Thank you, Representative Mashinsky, and thank you to your forethought on this bill. This was this, you know, you did this work years and years and years ago. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that you had to, uh, you know, compromise. But this is what this is about, right? We can compromise. Now we're at the at the final stages. I, again, I'm hoping that this bill goes through. And also, you know, I think to Representative Gresco's idea where the balloon industry Rather than them fighting against us, let's fight together to clean up the, clean up our environment and clean up our world. So I think uh, it could be a win-win for everybody. And I thank again the entire environment committee for their their work that they're doing on this this year. Thank you, and thank you to all the people that are coming after me to uh, it, for their support on this bill as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Representative Haynes. I really appreciate it. And you know, I've told the story before, um, but um, you know. I, we know about, you know, we hear about the the detrimental effects uh, that balloons have on wildlife, but it was absolutely horrifying to watch, you know, on one of the osprey cams at Hammond Acid to see, uh, you know, to see it live, you know, this osprey struggling with um, a balloon wrapped around its talon and what that meant for that osprey as it was trying to dive into the water for its livelihood and, and catch fish. And, um, you know, it was really horrifying to watch. And so we need to prevent these things from happening. And I appreciate your leadership on it. Um, I see, um, I don't, I do not see uh, Diane Lorichella. So I'm going to go to Eric Hammerling of Connecticut Forest and Park Association. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the Environment Committee, and happy Pi Day. My name is Eric Hammerling, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. I'm also the co-chair with Amy Patterson of the Open Space Review Board which advises deep on the Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Grant Program, known as OSWA, as well as on development of the state's green plan. Wearing both hats, I'm here to express strong support for HB 5296, which would increase the bond authorization for the OSWA Matching Grant Program to 10 million. I also hope the committee will consider the request that we and others submitted in testimony to extend this authorization to 10 million per year in light of the significant catch up required to meet Connecticut's statutory 21% open space goal. According to the Council on Environmental Quality's annual report, the municipalities, land trusts, and water companies supported by the OSWA grant program are just over 71% of the way to meeting their portion of the 21% goal. Over the past 25 years, the Oswa Grants Program at DEEP has awarded approximately $150 million in matching grants to almost 620 projects conserving over 40,000 acres statewide. DEEP has done a lot of good work to get these grants out to projects despite being chronically understaffed. But unfortunately, the average pace over that span of 5 million per year to protect 1,600 acres per year is just too slow. If the rate of investing in open space stays the same, it will take us more than 60 years to acquire the approximate 100,000 acres of open space left under the 21% goal. As a reminder, the target year for reaching the 21% goal is 2023. Open space provides communities with places for recreation that support physical and mental health, habitats for wildlife, nature-based climate solutions, 
and a multitude of ecosystem services. Open space supports local economies and sustains Connecticut's quality of life. And it's important to add that the Oswa program invests in rural, suburban, and urban areas with funding dedicated to green spaces and community gardens located in targeted and distressed communities. If statutory goals like the 21% open space requirement are to be meaningful, we must increase Connecticut's pace of investment now. HB 5296 takes a strong step in the right direction, especially if the 10 million authorized in this bill ultimately becomes the base bonding authorization level every year for the Oswa grants. Thank you for raising this bill and the opportunity to testify in strong support. I'd be glad to respond to any questions you may have. Thanks so much, Eric, and, and well done in keeping to, to your three minutes there. I wonder if you could just talk about a little bit about um, how, I wanna say oversubscribed, um, you know, the, the applications are. Um, what, do you have a dollar figure or the amount of applications that have to be overlooked um, each year because this program isn't well-funded? Thank you for the question, Senator Cohen. It is pretty typical uh, every year that uh, when DEEP has its uh, grant round for uh, OSWA grants, there are uh, significantly more requests, uh, you know, five to $10 million more every year um, than can be funded. Um, I would say it would be even more than that, um, but uh, it is a hard process to go through uh, for a land trust you know, to apply for funding from DEEP. They have to do appraisals and they have to do a lot of due diligence that costs money. And I would say if uh, some of the expenses uh, involved with even applying to the program were lower, or if those were allowable expenses that could be paid for as part of the OSWA uh, program process, we'd see even more uh, applications for support. But every year, um, you know, there are significantly more re requests than DEEP can fund with available dollars. Okay, I appreciate your answer to that. I see my co-chair, Representative Gresco, has a question for you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just to give the committee perspective, um, Eric, uh, there were in the past, two grant rounds uh, every year, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes, in, in fact, uh, the, the statute that um, established the Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Program requires, uh, it, it's a shall statement, there shall be two rounds of funding each year, um, but that has not been the case for several years that that's been adhered to. We would love to see the, the program get back on that type of a cycle, but obviously, you know, additional funding will be required to make sure that all happens. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Fresco, and I see Representative Dillon has her hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair, and hello, Eric. Eric thank you very much for your testimony. Is there, uh, is there any, language in the statute, which I regret I don't have in front of me, um, that looks at statewideness uh, for uh, land acquisition or for the plan? Sure. Well, there, there is uh, specifically in the language of the statute, um, I, I think uh, an understanding that this should not be a program that's only dedicated to acquiring land in rural or suburban areas. Um, there is language that um, both through the OSWA program and its predecessor, the Charter Oak program, uh, in, it includes the dedication of funding to targeted and, and distressed communities. And I know that uh, as part of OSWA, there is a, a program called the uh, Urban Green and Community Garden Program, which right. in New Haven and you know, other communities has been a, 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 you know, a great program to provide some uh, investments uh, in urban areas. Thank you. Yes, on the, on the open space, I know, well, we have a local dispute about a playground that was sold, but that's, that's a local issue. But uh, it, would, it would stand to reason though that some towns have more land than others. 
And, and so um, I, I was wondering regionally and, and in terms of uh, whether or not there's any requirement that, that open space be open to the public, uh, that, that, that that's part of the plan. Um, there are gonna be physical limits in, in, in some towns, no matter what you do or I do. Uh, and uh, and I, I guess I'm thinking of access. Yeah, it's a great question, Representative Dillon. And uh, when, when Deep, Deep gives a grant under the OSWA program, uh, what the state holds as part of its, um, as part of the program is a conservation restriction uh, on the property, which uh, it, it doesn't allow it to be developed in the future. But another requirement of that is that um, the property be um, available to the public, usually for recreational access. Um, the Ur urban green and community garden program uh, also tends to adhere to that. But of course, as, as you might imagine, there are certain types of uh, restrictions that have to be put on agricultural properties that may have uh, you know, it, there are growing crops that, uh, you know, might potentially have to be protected. So there, there are those types of, um, you know, a, a allowable restrictions. But overall, the program is dedicated to ensuring that since uh, public funds are being used, there should be a requirement of public access. Thank you. Yes, no, in the uh, garden programs are worthy programs, there's, there's a problem in some areas because of the lead in the soil and and the need to get good compost. So operationalizing it is, is always a heavy lift, but, but I, I appreciate your answer and thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Dillon. And, and I should just quickly add that um, the, the interest in um, investing in green spaces, not just uh, community gardens is evolving uh, within DEEP and within the program. I think there would be um, additional interest uh, eventually in, in um, acquiring more green spaces in urban areas as part of the OSWA program, uh, understanding that there would be potential soil contamination and other issues like, like you mentioned. Um, and, you know, again, it, it's a matter of funding uh, to be able to make those additional investments. And I think it would be a, a great advancement for the program. Thank you. Yes, a good soil is like gold, you know. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Representative, and thank you, Eric, for being with us today. Thank you. Um, I do not believe we've got Joseph Donato in the room, so let's go to Jennifer Race, followed by Adam Harris. Welcome, Jennifer. Oh, you're on mute, Jennifer. You're muted. Yep. Just kidding, sorry, I thought I hit that button. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jennifer Reese. I am a lifelong Connecticut resident. I currently live in Bosra, Connecticut. I am a reptile and invert hobbyist, dedicated animal welfare advocate and proud US ARC member. I oppose uh, HB 5293 as it is written and I urge you to at least revisit and rewrite. Um, Connecticut already has extensive laws regarding animal welfare and cruelty. This new law, should it pass, uh, seems to me to be superfluous. Um, and it will only serve to create criminals of good, good citizens simply trying to educate, entertain, and, and stigma surrounding certain amazing and misunderstood species. The language currently used therein is, um, to me, dangerously ambiguous. With current verbiage, the language could and will likely be enforced to end educational programs altogether, removing school, library, Girl Scout programs and the like will likely be the first step, again, based on current wording and the cleverly crafted ambiguity it consists of. I see no valid reason to punish educators, passionate hobbyists, and the innocent children who benefit from their knowledge as tangible experiences matter, um, especially to our impressionable youth. I feel this bill is far reaching, redundant and unnecessary. I strongly urge you to vote in opposition of HB 5293. Uh, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, 
Thank you so much, Ms. Reese. Um, I, I do notice that in section one of the bill, there is an exemption for educational programs. Um, are you saying that this doesn't go far enough? I, I believe that the allowances they're giving just aren't quite enough. I, I think it's going to restrict a lot of smaller educational programs for like libraries and such. I think it's great that um, zoos and, and maybe higher organizations will be allowed to continue their programs. But for someone say that is just a small time hobbyist and really is passionate about their animals and maybe they just want to share education, say at a, at a library, or a, a, even a children's birthday party, so long as that person is being responsible, I see no reason to stop them from doing so. I think educating our children is so important. And I also believe that um, just eradicating programs in general is, is detriment detrimental to not only the youth, uh, but the animals as well. Is there any requirement right now for these smaller programs to be licensed? I'm just trying to um, think about what if there's um, not language. that I'm aware of, and I am not necessarily opposed to restrictions. Of course, we want safety first for everyone involved, the animals, um, the children, the handlers. Um, so I'm not necessarily opposed to some restriction, but the way it is written as of right now, seems to be very much up for interpretation and a quite slippery slope in my opinion. Okay, well, I appreciate your testimony. I don't see any other questions from the committee. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Adam Harris followed by Ava Capetti Lefebvre. Welcome Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for hearing my concerns. This is regarding House Bill 5293 as well. Uh, my name is Adam Harris. I am the owner of Harrison Wonderland uh, LLC, which is a second generation small business based out of Canton, Connecticut. Uh, it is a retail location, but we also offer educational services as an additional component to our business. Um, among other things, our company provides first and foremost a lot of um, information about current and potential pets that people may be interested in obtaining, both domestic and exotic. We provide access to the proper and essential uh, care and support items involved in maintaining those animals in captivity in the best possible way. Uh, and additionally, we do provide a wide variety of outreach programs, both on-site and off-site. Um, I do travel to schools, libraries, nature centers, environmental education facilities, uh, I've done scout groups, uh, daycares. I've even done uh, programs at convalescent homes, special interest groups. Um, I have spoken uh, at various conferences and events, oftentimes involving um, a live animal along uh, as uh, support for those, those programs, um, and including uh, manned educational booths and displays at some of these events. Um, all in the name of promoting uh, these animals in a health, healthy, comfortable, positive atmosphere and, and spreading uh, good information about these animals. Um, the most popular program that we do does involve reptiles and amphibians, which is also a sector that is often misunderstood, um, feared, uh, even prosecuted out of that fear and misunderstanding. I've been running this uh, particular program for 27 years, reaching thousands of people. Um, in a variety of different venues and in always in a positive way um, and maintaining a strict um, personal uh, adherence to the handling and uh, use of those animals. Uh, in addition to all of that, I provide animals to the film and entertainment industry as well, which requires uh, travel to studios often in New York City. So I do travel uh, not only within state, but out of state uh, with certain animals for this purpose. Uh, some animals have been featured in, in various commercials, uh, movies, um, programs aired on HBO and Stars, Netflix, things like that. But if I could highlight just one of those uh, ventures, I would like to make specific mention of work that we've done with Sesame Street, um, including episode, uh, I don't know the number of it, but it's in season 52, which is the current one in which uh, Elmo learns specific things about the care of a pet in a uh, 
episode, I think it's entitled Gary Gets a Gecko, or no, Gary the Gecko, something along those lines. Um, and in, in additional short segments, uh, including Oscar the Grouch easing the mind, uh, may have uh, irrational or rational fears. Of, Mr. Harris, uh, Mr. Yes. Harris, I'm sorry, your time has expired. Would you please summarize? Yes. Uh, in summary, I'm sorry about that. I actually thought I should start a uh, thing a timer, but I didn't. Uh, my concern is in the travel uh, and limitations thereof of any of these creatures preventing me from doing any of these avenues of our business um, and continuing to do positive work in um, in promoting and the education of the animals involved in our this sector of our uh, of our operation. And it's limiting opportunities, but I'm not so concerned about my opportunities as the general public and their opportunities uh, to be educated and have access to proper education and good information in those channels. Um, the, the wording of the bill seems to prohibit the, mo the mo movement of those animals, which would negatively impact my ability to do that. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Harris. And I just uh, as I asked Ms. Reese, I because I uh, I'm not as familiar with the regulation around this um, these types of educational programs. Is there any type of special license that you need um, to provide the education with your reptiles in particular? As far as I know, it is not a there is no permit that is required to do these um, these programs. Um, and, and a positive uh, opportunity might be to provide that or opportunity for that licensing um, and sort of regulate that industry or those concerns through through that avenue of, uh, I don't know how enforceable it is or, or anything like that. That's not really uh, my cup of tea there, but um, I'm not aware that there is a current uh, licensing for that specific thing. Okay, I, I only ask because, that, as I said in section one, there's um, you know provisions to uh, exempt certain parties um, from this, and exactly. um, specifically with with respect to education. And in a section one uh, one subsection two c. It talks about those being permitted by the DEEP, um, and and there's some stipulations about the uh, the animals um, being kept um, for a certain amount of time in in mobile or traveling housing. So um, I'm just you know I think we'll have to do a little bit of digging into this um, yes. to see um, you know who it applies to and um, and and whether we need to you know have some provisions as you say. Uh, to make sure that we know who you folks are who have these yeah. educational programs and uh, perhaps a, a permitting process. Um, but, yes. but I appreciate um, I appreciate your testimony today and I don't see any hands raised. So thank you for okay. being here. Thank you. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Just under the wire, Representative Wilson. Oh. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I was a little slow on the trigger there. Uh, Mr. Harris, uh, thank you for coming in today. Um, so, um, do you do you have any employees? I do. And how many, sir? Currently, I have uh, two employees and a volunteer. Okay. And um, are you aware um, in the state of Connecticut is there a trade association of your type of business or organization? I am a licensed pet shop, but outside of that. No, as far in regards to the services provided uh, for the educational component. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I'll wait. Maybe another individual could answer that question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Michel. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Harris, for your uh, testimony. Uh, I was going to ask you, because I, there's a very specific list of, of species covered by the bill. And I did not see uh, uh, reptiles or amphibians in the list. Where would you where would you have seen that it affects reptiles and amphibians? I actually am of the understanding that it just uh, specified exotic animals versus domestic. I'm not aware that there was any listing of uh, or any specification of certain species. 
It's in the language, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we lost our chair. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I'm going to, well, let's, where'd she go? Um, I'm going to uh, take over. Uh, and uh, I don't see any other hands raised in the room, uh, Mr. Harris. So, oh, it's, uh, and uh, so uh, thank you for your testimony and for your patience uh, today. Thank you for hearing me. Uh, moving Next forward, um, we have. Uh, so I believe I uh, Joanne, Joanne, Joanne uh, Basile, followed by Amy Millardi. Joanne, are you there? I am. Thank you. Uh, Co-chairs, uh, Senator Cohen and Representative Gresco, honorable members of the Joint Committee on the Environment. I'm Joanne Basile, Executive Director of Connecticut Votes for Animals, a grassroots organization advocating for animals on behalf of our almost 6,000 supporters across the state. CVA is also a member of the Connecticut Coalition to Protect Bears, representing environmental and animal advocates, uh, promoting non-lethal solutions to peacefully coexisting with bears and other wildlife. I'm here today to voice CVA's strong opposition to SB 244. Let me begin by making clear that CVA has no issue with the right and need for farmers to protect their crops and livestock. This is a farmer's livelihood and the state should offer those protections. CVA, however, asserts that the authority already exists in two places of the law, Connecticut General Statutes 26.3, which gives deep, broad authority to destroy wildlife it determines has aggressively invades or destroys crops, life, livestock, et cetera, and 2647, the current nuisance wildlife statute. SB 244 is a dangerous expansion of existing authority, and if passed, the bill will sanction a level of hostile fire against our state's wildlife. The bill is at odds with scientifically sound wildlife management principles. Specifically, the bill expands covered situations to hobby beekeepers and people with chickens in their backyard, offering protection well beyond an individual who makes their living from agricultural farming. It fails to define and establish a standard for unreasonable, unreasonable damage by wildlife that triggers a hunt. It grants the authority uh, to hunt virtually um, to anyone by delegating wildlife killing, expands the time to 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, demands no proof that the target wildlife is in fact the wildlife doing the damage, sets no limit on the number of species killed. It makes no requirement for individuals to take reasonable steps to protect crops and livestock and to demonstrate non-lethal methods were tried. Lastly, by allowing a hunter to keep its kill, SB 244 creates an incentive to kill our highly prized and protected species, bears and bobcats. As many of you know, that there is a high priced market for bear gallbladders and paws. When you kill wildlife because they damage crops but never solve the underlying itch issue, it only perpetuates the cycle of problems and the cycle of killing. A strong program of education where DEEP can help farmers learn and use the latest methods of keeping their crops and livestock safe from predators, coupled with DEEP's existing authority to destroy wildlife damaging agricultural crops and livestock, livestock is what is needed and what will work. I urge the committee not to make an error and establish an open season on all of Connecticut's wildlife 24 hours a day, all year long. The tools are there, they just need to be used. Thank you. Uh, oh, you're I'm, back. I'm back. Hey. <laughs> move to, uh, to attendee and move to back again. So, you know, these, these are our uh, Zoom glitches that we have. Um, Joanne, thanks so much for your testimony. I really appreciate it. And I, I wonder if you might um, provide some examples um, that you think could, you know, help the farmers uh, prevent crop damage. Um, I know we have talked about, you know, in the past we've had a, a similar bill and we've talked about um, various methods. And I know Deep was um, with us this morning and talked a little bit about electric fencing. I, there's definitely a cost concern there. So I just wonder if you could, could speak to that a little bit. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, thank you, Senator Cohen, for the question. Um, I'm going to uh, punt it just a little bit because I'm not a total expert in this area. Uh, there's excellent te testimony that was provided to the committee for the uh, by the Center for Biological Diversity, which goes on at great length, uh, and they are an expert in this area about the types of 
of uh, remediation that is available. And I was also, and obviously uh, Representative Mushinsky's uh, proposal to uh, bring in Corollian dogs uh, has proven to be very successful. Uh, lastly, I would uh, encourage uh, both DEEP and the committee to look at uh, uh, places around the country who have much more experience in this area uh, than we do in Connecticut, and particularly states out in the West. Colorado has an, a, a very good program. Canada has a, um, a program on uh, becoming bear aware and specifically to work with communities on developing good remediation. Uh, again, we, we don't, you know, we believe that, that, that farmers, I'd like to emphasize the term farmers, uh, have the right to keep their crops safe. And, uh, and that there has to be methods um, that will help them do that. Uh, I think that's where DEEP should be spending its energies is really working directly with the, with the farmers to help them in that regard. And then utilize their authority, which in their broad authority um, has them be the expert in terms of, of uh, taking uh, the wildlife that are actually being damaged. It doesn't delegate it to people who may or may not have any experience in that area. I appreciate that. Uh, I see Representative Michelle has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Joanne, uh, and for everything that you do and CDA does. Uh, precious work. Um, how do you see that uh, this Bill 244 is uh, different from the uh, current nuisance statutes? Because, I mean, we're still talking about uh, killing wildlife. Right, right. Thank you, Representative Michelle, for that question. I want to point out to perhaps maybe the most, uh, there, there are two critical areas where it is different. First of all, obviously this bill before the committee, SB 244 will allow uh, hunting and it really is hunting uh, under the guise of something else, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, right now, as you know, the nuisance wildlife bill only allows hunting at nighttime. Uh, so this expands it to any time during the day. And secondly, and almost as important, maybe even in some instances, more important because if the committee is truly interested in helping farmers, then they need to direct this to farmers. The way the bill, uh, SB 244 is, is, is uh, drafted, it allows anybody who's got pet chickens in their backyard uh, from, uh, it allows them to be able to uh, get uh, a permit to go out and kill any kind of wildlife. Uh, it doesn't make any requirements of them to ensure that they've uh, got the protections in place. So there are clearly some things missing here that would go a long way towards making this um, more targeted to really where it's intended to go, which is to farmers. Thank you, Ms. Bazil. Thank you very much. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative and uh, the ranking member, Senator Minor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good to see you, Joanne. <clears throat> so I don't know if you heard me this morning. We're trying to uh, figure out a way to uh, provide some relief to the agriculture community. Um, and I think uh, what's kind of lost in the conversation with some is that the losses are real. Um, you know, I, I've provided information for a number of years now, and it, it doesn't seem to matter in some circles what the information says, it's never sufficient. So what do I tell uh, constituents, uh, not only in my district, I've gotten phone calls from folks in Representative Christine Palm's district um, and throughout the state of Connecticut, what do I tell them uh, when they have lost an animal uh, that is valued? Uh, in some cases, it's part of a farming operation, uh, certainly always agriculture. Uh, what do I tell the beekeepers? Uh, what do I tell the folks that um, lose multiples of acres um, of sweet corn. Uh, what do I tell them? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter which approach we try. 
um, there's always the same response from the same group, and that is, you're not trying hard enough. But I can assure you that most of the people that have bee colonies uh, try very hard. They have electric fences. They monitor their bee colonies. Um, but the truth of the matter is, unless you're able to train a bear to the shock early, they're able to get under the wire. They get through the wire. Uh, they decimate the beehive. Um, I referred to an instance, I think, in Representative Palm's district where a bear made access into a barn and killed a woman's donkey. Uh, I think it was on her 85th birthday. Um, this doesn't seem to mean anything to some people. So what do I tell these people? Tough luck? <laughs> uh, and no, it, Senator Minor. And, and it's not funny, Joanne. It's, it's really beyond ridiculous. Well, Senator, Ma, I would um, I know that you would never say that to one of your constituents. And uh, first, let me say to you that I'm pleased we had an opportunity to have this exchange uh, during your uh, last uh, year uh, at the Environment Committee. <clears throat> um, there are a couple of things I'd like to say about that. I don't, as I said at the outset of my uh, testimony, I don't have issues with our trying to focus uh, on farmers. This bill doesn't do that. This bill is anybody who has, you know, a hobby beekeeper and a hobby, I don't know if there's such a thing called a hobby chicken keeper, uh, but people who have, I, I live in a very suburban beach community along the shoreline and there are people in my neighborhood who have chickens in their backyards. So this would allow them, for instance, who would be, you know, upset if a coyote got to their chickens kind of a natural thing to do. So um, I think that, uh, I think the concern is absolutely legitimate with respect to farmers. Uh, <clears throat> do, I, do I think that we need to go, I, I think this is the wrong bill. If that's your concern, this is the wrong bill. A, because it doesn't target it on farmers and it should. Um, B, because, um, you know, you already, I don't know, you, the state already has the authority to be able to do this. And the and I would suggest that you might want to uh, you've had you had deep on um, before you today that more needs to be done on the part of deep. I mean there are methods. I don't I don't say that they're not expert in a certain limited areas, but I think they really need to up their game. Number one, and I would like to have them use their very broad authority to be able to take wildlife if it is creating damage. And they, you know we we. They, they don't tend to use that. I, I don't know why, maybe there isn't a large number, but as they said, as they inferred earlier, excuse me, earlier this morning, but the statute exists there. And I also would, would just perhaps us look again at the statute, uh, at the proposed bill, I think it was in 2019, um, that the committee put forward on, um, uh, it, it was uh, in finding non-lethal methods. You know, I don't think we are, certainly not me, but certainly we are not expert in, um, uh, in, in all of the effective ways uh, that, can, uh, that, that can be developed and used uh, in, by, by a farmer. And I, I think farmers need the help. And I think DEEP should be giving them that help. So <clears throat> before I let you go, um, if the language was amended to be very clear about its, what, it, what its intent was, that it would be under the direction of DEP, there would have to have been documented damage. There would have to have been uh, some demonstration of loss to an actual farmer under whatever definition that state of Connecticut has. You would not be opposed to that. I would certainly be supportive of making this a more refined uh, piece of legislation. So, so this By is, doing some of the things that you suggested would certainly be a tremendous improvement. Right, but, but to be honest with you, you know, we've been at this a long time. I'm, I doubt very much I will ever hear the words at some point, um, you can agree with the taking of an animal's life, whether it's the agency 
or a farmer that's been impacted. Am I correct there? Senator Minor, I, you know, as I said in the <clears throat> in the beginning of my statement, we don't have an issue with the protection that farmers need. And we think that it's already there in the statute. But um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but the, the agencies testified that they believe it's not. No, 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 no. The agency has, uh, I, the agency was looking with, at. I, I've spoken no, no, with I, the agency. I you understand. have, you know, yeah. I haven't had, I mean, it, it, I, I do understand from this morning's hearing that um, there is now a question about their ability to be able to, um, to, uh, uh, to shoot, to use the nuisance wildlife statute to shoot bears. They do have the authority, I believe still, under uh, section, um, pardon me for a second, it's uh, Connecticut General Statutes 26-3, and it is a very broad authority on the part of the agency, and I believe that gives them the authority. There are other places also where it's inferred. It's clearly, sorry, this sounds odd, it's clearly not clear. Well, what is clear is that they don't even have staff to go out and investigate they don't send people out at the time uh, a situation is occurring. And so, um, you know, I appreciate the time you've taken not only this year, but in years past uh, on this issue. Um, I think it's safe to say I'm trying to find a solution and um, I, I'm not optimistic that you'll ever agree to it, but that's all right. Thank we you. got you got me real close, Senator Miner. So you know, but we do sit on opposite sides of the uh, of the uh, issues, I, the spectrum I think issue. You, I think you and I both know how close you were. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Senator Miner. Uh, Representative Michelle, for the second time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, John. I just wanted to go back to something because I I, I heard over and over the attempts to talk about certain groups of people, and I apologize for that. But I wanted to ask you, did, did, would you be supportive if deep, if we put more money from the general fund into deep, uh, to have more deep agents and to have more conservation in our state? Absolutely. I mean, we would absolutely, and to raise the level of expertise at deep, uh, to move deep away from what I have always considered to be a conflict of interest. Deep's funding comes from, as, as you all well know, uh, a lot of, on the wildlife side, a lot of it comes from hunting licenses. Plus there is the federal program that taxes bullets and that money is, is pushed into states. Sure. I mean, I would love to see, you know, we're, we're getting, we understand that there's a, a rush on, uh, a rush, there's a, a, a movement on retirements. Uh, deep will be impacted with that. We would love to see them hire people with real expertise um, and uh, a real interest in conservation measures. Right, and I, thank you. And I, I think it's safe to say that we, uh, you know, every everybody. If 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 we should associate a group, I think everybody recognizes the fact that there are damages and that there are uh, monetary damages and. I don't, I've never heard our group say that nothing should be done about it. Um, if we should talk about specific groups of people. And, um, and I, would, I would also say that um, it all comes to funding and all we need to do is just fund deep more and have more agents and have better conservation in our state and protection. You know, this is an environment committee where we are really discussing things that should be promoting conservation and the environment. And Thank I think that would be supported by the general, by the public in the state of Connecticut. We are a very conservation oriented state. Sure, sure are. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. And, and thank you, Joanne, for being with us today. Thank you. Okay, next we have Amy Mullardy, followed by Karen Lasky. Welcome, Amy. Hello there, uh, good afternoon, co-chair Senator Cohen and Representative Gresco, co-vice chair Senator Slap and Representative Palm and ranking members, Senator Minor and Representative Harding. Thank you for the public hearing of House Bill 5293 and thank you to the 18 co-sponsors as of today, including committee members, Senator Slap, Representative Michelle and Senator Haskell. 
I'd also like to briefly thank my representative, Representative Labriola, who represents the 131st district for his continued support of this proposed bill since 2019. Um, my name is Amy Millardi. I reside in the 131st district in Oxford, and I've been advocating for this bill um, since 2019. I believe this bill reflects the conscious awakening of the public to end the use of wild and exotic animals as entertainment. This is evidenced by the very few circuses that travel to and the very few venues that will host them in Connecticut. It is also cost prohibitive for traveling circuses to come to the Northeast, considering that our sister states of New York and New Jersey have restrictive laws banning this type of entertainment. New York City and the state of New Jersey to be specific. I'm excited about this bill. I think it aligns with the temperature of our nation and worldwide and it reflects what our politicians at the federal level support with regard to the federal bill titled Traveling Ex with Exotic Animals and Public Safety Protection Act. Um, that's specifically HR 5999 and SB 3220, uh, which Senator Blumenthal, U.S. Congresswoman Hayes, and U.S. Congressman Himes have all supported. So in short, I, I'm very happy for the public hearing, and I thank you all. Thank you so much, Ms. Malardi. And I, I don't know if you heard um, some of the prior testimony um, from um, folks who use reptiles in particular for educational purposes. Do you know what other states are doing um, in that regard? I don't, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Thank you. I see Representative Michelle has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Judge. Just very quick uh, comment. Uh, thank you very much, Amy, for your uh, very factual comments. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Michelle. All right. Seeing no other questions, uh, thank you, Amy, again, for your testimony today. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, we have Karen Lasky, followed by Dan Mangano. Karen, are you with us? Hi. Hi. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Co-Chair Senator Cohen and Representative Gresgro, Honorable Members of Environment Committee. My name is Karen Lasky. I live in Manchester and on the Board of Directors representing Connecticut Votes for Animals, an organization, as you heard, with almost 6,000 supporters across Connecticut. CBA strongly supports passage of House Bill 5293, um, prohibiting the wild and exotic animals and traveling animal acts. Um, with a change to remove includes any animal that is not domesticated in line 33. I have been documenting animals and traveling shows for 28 years and working on legislation similar to 5293 since 2005. What follows are my observations from fil filming these traveling animal acts. There is no question that animal acts are a cruel and unnecessary business. Elephants, for example, can even take an essential mud bath as they are hosed down to look pretty and dust is blown off them. Wild animals need to walk and run, which they need for proper digestion, exercise, and psychological wild being. Being shackled and caged causes animals to develop neurotic behaviors like pacing, head bobbing, self-mutilation, depression, and aggression that can end up dangerous for humans. There have been many incidents of wild animals injuring trainers or spectators because they were scared or traumatized. You can't train a wild animal with positive reinforcement, so they are beaten until they are broken. This intimidation continues as long as the animals are used, often for many decades. In Connecticut, I witnessed a baby elephant being traumatized so she wouldn't defecate in the ring during the show. While hiding under a truck, I saw several circus workers surround the baby and stomp their feet while yelling till she defecated right there. Another time, a circus worker was loading llamas onto a trailer. One llama appeared to be frightened and would not go up the ramp. The man used something in his hand and stuck it into the llama's vagina. She then bolted forward. I have short foot footage from years and years and, and recent footage of the last circus here um, in Danbury um, on some videos here you can watch if you'd like. Uh, wild animals in traveling shows suffer emotionally and physically and many times die a miserable death 
from an untreated longstanding ailment. What do children learn from these displays of insensitivity? What are they thinking when they are at a fair in Guilford watching bears riding horses? They learn that bullying an innocent animal is entertainment and legal in Connecticut. People have become more aware of the callous treatment of animals in traveling acts, and parents understand how children learn a warped view of nature by watching wild animals performing silly tricks. I'm sorry, Ms. Well, Lasky, but your time has expired. Could you please summarize? Sure. Um, there's so many countries, cities. Um, you, Ukraine was just in the midst of banning um, circuses with wild animals. There are, uh, I think, 49 other countries that have banned this, as well as the cities of uh, Bridgeport in Stamford in Connecticut, uh, Bristol Commons, Goodyear Tire, the Red Cross, Western Connecticut State University, Manchester School District, Manchester Community Technical College, Danbury Ice Palace. Uh, the Yard Goats canceled an act of monkeys riding dogs because of the public outcry. And... Um, we have no other agenda here, the people are, who are speaking for the animals, other than to see the suffering of the animals in traveling shows and, and to retire them to sanctuaries that are awaiting them. Thank you for bringing this up. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. I see Representative Palm has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Hi. Chair. Hi, Karen. It's good to see you. Thank you for mm -hmm. coming and joining us today with your testimony. Um, can you please elaborate a little bit about the change that you propose for line 33? What, why would you say that animals not domesticated or bred in captivity? Well, um, uh, we think that um, domestication is used kind of widely. Um, uh, and we think um, the promoters, the venues will use this as a loophole. Um, domestication is not the same as taming. A domestic animal is genetically determined to be tolerant of humans. It's come over thousands of years that we pick traits in certain animals that um, are, are are useful to us, and then we selectively breed them. That's de domestication. Taming it, it, what happens with circus animals is something else, and they're never, ever trained. Um, they may try to avoid harm and pain and being broken and being beaten, and they learn how to avoid that, and they're afraid of the weapons used against them after that. But that's as far that they're not domesticated. They're just broken. They're, they're not trying to please us the way a dog would has been. Right. About right. Feral nature. Like, you know, like a Portuguese water dog has all those traits have been bred into them over the years to, you know. Yeah. And it, originally dogs or wolves or whatever, you know, were companions with humans early on kind of they brought them they came to the humans <laughs> yeah so. i think it's an important distinction um do you believe that this bill as written has enough safeguards for the educators uh, the you know the people who some of the people who are opposing this bill say that it would limit their ability to uh do a traveling um educational display to a school do you do you believe this bill uh, allows for that or are you opposed to people bringing snakes into a school to show, you know, herpetology, et cetera? Personally, I think um, certain educational exhibits are, are, are okay, but they need high standards. Um, I've seen so-called educational exhibits like at the Connecticut Expo Center. I've seen a lot of educational exhibits and there's a heck of a lot of, you know, birthday parties and TV commercials and entertainment. And um, it was more like entertainment. It wasn't, oh, look what this animal can do and look and listening to me. And and then they're thrown in like a cat carrier put in the back of a car because I've watched this. I've hidden behind things and watched what they do with them. They throw them in the back of the truck and then they take them to the next venue. They're not all like that. I understand. But we need the standards to show them that they can only do it humanely. Mm -hmm. And th it, there shouldn't be a lot of these shows. There shouldn't be that the animal is always traveling. Um, they, they need 
the respite. Great. Thank you, Karen, very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Michelle. I, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to recognize Karen uh, and for her extensive work. Uh, she's sent a lot of interesting documentation, so I just wanted to recognize that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. You, Representative Michelle. Thank you, uh, and, and thanks again, Karen, for your testimony with us today. Oh, thank you for hearing the bill. Uh, next, we have Dan Magano, followed by Julie Stankwitz. Dan, Hi, can you hear me? Oh, I yeah. think so. Perfect. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know how to turn my video on, so I'm going to do this blind. But um, I just wanted to speak on uh, House Bill 5293. Um, as a constituent of Connecticut, I'm concerned about the bill and the ambiguous and dangerous language with which it is written. Uh, I'm also concerned that certain bill sponsors have chosen to mislead those in opposition, be it intentionally or due to ignorance of the language within. Uh, intent matters in legislation when those who enforce it are not the ones who write it. Uh, so the language has to be clear and concise. So I'm very concerned about the language here and how ambiguous it is. Um, education and in-person hands-on opportunities are the single best and most effective way to inspire passion for animals and their conservation as it did with me as a child and continues to as an adult. Um, so as a child, many passionate animal keepers and wildlife rehabbers came to our schools and our classrooms and uh, with these experiences, to this day, I remember owls like E.T. 30 years later, uh, still imprinted in my mind what that animal did for me and to make me passionate about, you know, conservation and these things. So the language in this bill would remove these opportunities as written. It would take away our best and most effective way to educate and inspire people to be passionate and conserve our native and exotic species. So as written, I would say, please do not pass this. Uh, it's ultimately redundant when we already have cruelty laws in place for mistreated animals. I would much rather see something that increases the enforcement and punishment of that for those who violate. Um, you know, as spoken by the previous person, you do see a lot of these, these circuses and traveling animals that are mistreated. Obviously, I would hope nobody is for that. And the only people that would be for that would be people that are profiting from it. Um, but I think the language as written is going to do more, more harm than good because it's, it's redundant legislation and then also is going to punish responsible people and constituents who want to get out there and educate people with these animals. Uh, when it comes to education, I'm sorry, I just hit a button. Am I still there? Yeah. Okay, sorry. When it comes to education, I've seen the value of these opportunities for traveling education with snakes in particular. Um, to take people from killing our native species to seeing their value as individuals and what they offer an ecosystem through one tangible experience uh, with these animal ambassadors. M many of the times, obviously, people are using what we would deem exotic animals, but a lot of these exotic animals have been in captivity for literally centuries, but a lot of them have been, have been captively bred for decades and decades and many generations. And uh, these animals know nothing but a captive environment. Uh, it's where they're comfortable. Uh, and, you know, obviously we're not going to use an animal for an educational program that's going to be dangerous to the people involved, nor do we want an animal that's going to be stressed out and not uh, showing Thank off you. its best personality. I, I'm sorry, your time has expired. Could you please summarize? Uh, sure. Uh, basically, I would just like to see this not passed as written. I think the intent is solid. I think that the language within, however, is going to open up too much interpretation for those that have to enforce it. And as such, when they are not the ones with the intent, all they're going to do is enforce it as written. And as written, I think it's it's overreach and it's not going to accomplish what the goal is, which is to, uh, to you know, protect these animals and still allow for education. Thank you so much, Mr. Magano. Are you a, a wildlife educator yourself? So I work with a 501c3 and through that we do do educational programs. Obviously with COVID that's been reduced to, uh, to very limited. Um, but I have done them for close to 20 years and everything from, you know, the birthday parties as discussed, my animals I, I have used in such programs and my animals are my children. So I would not put them into a situation where they are, are being mistreated. Um, I specifically raise these animals in, in a, uh, you know, we, we do basically what we call choice based handling and teach the animals um, that they can signal us when they want to be handled when they don't. And we respect that. Um, I have animals that absolutely are, are very personable. Um, you know, I can't say enjoy meeting people because that's not the right term. I don't want to anthropomorphize. Um, but 
but these animals are used to it, uh, very comfortable with it. It does not affect their, their behavior, their temperament. It does not affect their health. So I, I have two, thank you for that. I have two questions for you. Um, one, I, I know that the language as written is cause for some concern we've heard from others today um, because uh, if uh, there's perhaps not a clear enough distinction between uh, non-domesticated animals and um, these exotic and wild animals. Um, mm -hmm. If there was a, a better distinction drawn, um, would you be more amenable to the language? It sounds like it, because you, you're in, in favor of the intent. Yeah, I, th I think the language on that part is less a big deal. Um, either we could go very specific onto what species we're talking about, because I know a lot of this is, is the bigger animals that are stuffed in little cages and carted around, and, and nobody likes to see that. Um, but... Uh, but I, I think just redefining domestication won't necessarily help because a lot of the animals that we use for these programs and have for decades are not considered domesticated. And the domestication definition in general has been kind of shifted all over the place, depending on, you know, which side you're on and how you want to use it and how you want to suit it. I think what would be better is to change the language to target specifically you know, the circus type operations that are abusing these animals that you're looking to go after and not the educational programs that are looking to go into classrooms and educate. Uh, however, you guys would see fit to do that. I'm not sure, but I, I think the language as written is not is not going to uh, to do more good than harm. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And, I, you know, there was an attempt to exempt uh, educational programs here. And it sounds like, you know, because you're working with a nonprofit organization that does this sort of thing, you, you're probably uh, licensed to provide these educational programs. I asked some others earlier if there was special licensing that they've obtained. Do you know uh, of uh, special permitting? Uh, so, that's... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, so Connecticut, honest, Connecticut's honestly a tricky state and working with animal control officers and everything, they will tell you that as well. Um, there's a lot of confusion. I've actually uh, helped our local animal control officers several times because they weren't able to interpret the laws that they're supposed to enforce already. Um, and so obviously that's why I made that point that we need to make it clear and concise. But um, um, I kind of lost where I was going with this. I apologize. Um, just curious about the permit. Oh, yeah. Permits? So, so Connecticut's tricky because they'll tell you with certain things that you're required to get a permit. And then when you go to get the permit, they'll tell you that the permit doesn't exist. And you just end up in this circle of nobody can give you a solid answer on what's going on. And obviously, you know, deep is already, um, you know, overwhelmed with the limited staff that they have. So adding more things on their plate doesn't seem really like a good idea. And the field officers at deep have always been very fantastic but they are not overly educated, especially when it comes to exotics. Um, you know, they're pretty good with our native stuff as they should be, uh, but exotics are a very tough thing for them. And it's something where, you know, you're not gonna learn in, in, in a few months in a classroom. You know, there's so many species out there. There's so many different things to know. Um, so I just, I, I don't know what Connecticut's plan is as far as permitting goes for that. But I mean, if they wanted to do some kind of a permit system for educational programs, I don't see any issue with that. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you. And I see Representative Michelle has a question for you. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a question. I have a comment uh, because we keep having, uh, just to for the sake of it, I'm going to say it on the record because we have a, a long hearing ahead of us, but um, the bill, I mean, in my view, does address to legitimate educational programs. And as Mr. McGann mentioned, he did mention the uh, wildlife re rehabbers, and we have those, and they're, they're actually trained by DEEP. So I, I'm sure there's a way that they'll be permitted by DEEP uh, when it comes to wildlife rehabbers. And then you mentioned snakes, and snakes are not a part of the bill. And so I, I just want to uh, re-emphasize the fact that there's a precise list of animals on the bill. And, 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 and that, you know, working with with the uh, deep might seem complicated in some aspects, but for example, the wildlife rehabilitators are trained by deep and officialized by deep as we have this. So I'm sure the permitting would not be an issue there. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. I do, I do just want to say for the record, because we have had, uh, I've been having conversations with LCO about this and 
there, I, you know, when we say there's a precise list, there is not a precise list in this bill. It does say wild and exotic, which by, you know, statutorily, by definition, that would include basically any undomesticated animal. And so I think this, this is where some of the concerns coming in about reptiles and, and snakes it may be something that we just need to tighten up and, and I hope that uh, we can work with some of the folks who have testified today as well as the proponents of the bill uh, within our committee and outside our committee to make sure that we get at the heart of what this is trying to do. Thank you, I think that some of the precision might be also focused where you were trying to go and I, I agree with that with the uh, um, domesticated, uh, that part, that sentence there, I think is where we should be targeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Much. Thank you so much, Representative. And, and thank you, Mr. Magano, for testifying today. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, I am going to hand the reins over to my co-chair, Representative Gresco, and I think we have uh, Julie Stankowitz, who is testifying next. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the co-chairs and the honorable members of the Environment Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I would like to give testimony in support of HB 5293 with amendment because I believe this legislation would protect animals from cruelty and protect public safety. I have been an advocate for animal welfare for many years and am currently a humane policy volunteer leader for the Humane Society of the United States. I have previously worked as a professional writer and researcher regarding animal welfare issues. And I'm a longtime supporter of organizations who free exotic animals from confinement in circuses and traveling shows. In these roles, I have learned about the physical and psychological traumas experienced by animals in the circus industry, and their suffering is truly heartbreaking. Wild and exotic animals do not naturally follow the commands of humans nor can their needs be met in circuses or traveling shows. Therefore, the harshest cruelties imaginable are utilized to make them submissive. For example, in order to make an elephant obedient to human captors, a wild calf undergoes a process with the intention of breaking his spirit. The calf is denied food and water and is beaten until he or she follows human commands. Once in captivity, it is common for elephants to experience ailments such as chronic foot infections, blindness, loneliness and boredom, malnourishment, and post-traumatic stress disorder. The Animal Welfare Act fails to protect circus animals from abuse and neglect, strengthening the need for a prohibition of animals in circuses and traveling shows to prevent cruelty. The Comerford Zoo, whose elephants have performed right here in Connecticut and who regularly perform at the Big E, has been cited by the USDA more than 50 times for failing to meet the very basic requirements of the Animal Welfare Act. One of their elephants, Beulah, suffered chronically from a foot disorder and collapsed and died at the Big E due to blood poisoning. Sadly, citations from the USDA have not resulted in any notable changes for Comerford's elephants. Circuses and traveling shows of this kind provide no educational benefit nor genuine connection to animals as the performing animals are forced into human interaction and deny the ability to display natural behaviors. The only value that is taught through circuses and traveling shows is exploitation. Learning about the roles of exotic animals in their natural environments is what I believe will provide education and generate true interest, connection to nature, compassion and conservation efforts. In the wild, exotic animals have lives of their own, families and essential roles to ecosystems that humans have no right to disturb. Elephants, for example, care for one another, show joy and grief, and even visit the bones of their deceased relatives for years. They create watering holes and pathways for other species and help to spread plant species, excuse me, plant seeds, all of which makes them a keystone species. It is these types of natural behaviors that make exotic animals so fascinating. Okay, I'm it sorry, but your time is expired. Could you please summarize? Yes, I would like to see this law passed uh, with the amendment uh, in line 33, because I would like to see uh, cruelty uh, to these circus animals ending. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Dave, uh, Representative Michelle has a question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Julie. Uh, by the way, thank you for uh, helping uh, 
figure out, uh, find, find out that we had all these uh, municipal shelters out of compliance uh, with uh, with uh, their reporting. Uh, I was just gonna say, you reminded me of when we had a kangaroo, a young kangaroo being displayed in a traveling zoo in Connecticut a couple of years back. I think I was just elected at the time and videos were flying all over the place and you know, kids trying to pet uh, a kangaroo go, pacing in circles uh, was just a horrific sight. And, um, and, you know, trying to get information from, or from DUAG, or from uh, the United States a Department of Agriculture, uh, FOIA has ended up with nothing, zero information, no responses. And, and so there is that aspect where like the uh, enforcement in case of cruelty is also lacking. That, that is one of the I, reasons I think it, that is highly supportive of this one, be highly supportive of the bill. Um, but uh, I, I think, I think something just came up from through your testimony that reminded me of uh, what other of my colleagues might have leaded to earlier, or even Mr. Magona earlier, that um, you know said this elephants, this, but it's not about size. There's nothing in this bill that talks about the size of animals. We're talking about all exotic, I mean exotic animals, and so. Um, I just thought about the size. I don't know when you were talking, it reminded me of the size. And earlier somebody said, you know, these are big animals we're talking about. And they could be small animals as well, like a young, uh, pacing, distressed kangaroo. Uh, yeah. But I appreciate everything that you do. And I just wanted to thank you um, for your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Michelle. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Well, thank you, Julie. And uh, seeing no other hands raised, we're going to move on to uh, Cindy Cavallini, followed by Jill Alibrandi. Thank you so much. Um, I am voicing my opposition to HB uh, 5293, the Ban on Traveling Animal Acts. Um, this bill on its face is meant to protect circus animals, yet it will definitely affect reputable outreach and education organiza organizations, as stated by um, prior um, people that have been speaking. There are many licensed exhibitors in the state of Connecticut that would be affected by this ban. These or organizations provide excellent husbandry for their animals and excel in their standards of care so they can present healthy and happy animals. You can't be an educator and bring an unhealthy or unhappy um, or uncontent animal to um, schools, libraries, you know, elderly home cares, uh, parties, and everywhere else where we bring our animals. Um, so it, we introduce conservation projects and ideals to people who may not generally have the opportunity to meet these animals or species so they can learn about them and their natural behaviors, habitats, and of course the challenges they face in the wild. Traveling or outreach organizations carry on very important work as having up close experiences with animals has proven to be one of the best ways to create personal investment and empathy in our natural world and these species. As a wildlife education specialist myself with a 35 year um, background in and education in exotic animal behavior, husbandry, training and management and an outreach organization um, owner myself. I know first from firsthand experience that animals are easily um, easily travel happily and comfortably in their crates, just as a child does in their car seat. Many animals actually display uh, behavior that shows that they enjoy the experience of doing these presentations as they enthusiastically come to the trainers uh, for the open in open crates in out of large enclosures. Amb ambassador animals typically live some of the most enriched and full lives of any animals under managed care as they are consistently able to experience new sights, smells, and sounds and other stimuli. Travel and outreach also breaks up the daily routine and keeps their lives exciting. We also enforce our own time restrictions and follow USDA guidelines for animals in our care so they do not spend excessive amounts of time traveling. I personally limit my travel to 50 miles radius and I limit a three um, program a day. Uh, I have a three program a day limit. So I do not exceed more than eight hours out of my facility. Um, Thank well, you, your time surface, is expired. Cindy, could you please wrap up? 
Sure. Um, so yeah, while on the surface, this this bill is meant to, I think, target circus animals. Um, it is. It will affect the animals in outreach organizations, um, and I don't feel that that's what the intention of it. But not only you know, say, having a list of animals, which I understand now that there is no specific list. But the problem is if, if there is a list that does get introduced, that list is easily expanded on. So it's easily going to be expanded, adding more and more animals. Um, so that is, that is my worry that this will affect these animal or outreach organizations, not just what is, it is written and intended for. Cindy, thank you for the uh, testimony and for uh, uh, waiting uh, your turn and your patience today. I don't see any hands raised in the room uh, for questions. So again, thank you for your time and for your perspective. Can I just say next. one more thing? Sorry, it, sorry. Right, we're gonna move um, on to, to the next person. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Okay. Uh, the next person is Jill Alibrandi, followed by Ann Godwin. Thank you, honorary members of the Environment Committee. My name is Jill Alibrandi and I'm from Reading, Connecticut and I'm requesting that you support HB 5293. I've been advocating against the use of wild animals and traveling acts for many years, taking countless footage of the abuse that these majestic animals have suffered at the hands of exhibitors and that how they have become slowly stripped of everything that would make their lives meaningful, but have been reduced to nothing more than a shell of what they once were. I have witnessed a single circus handler dragging with bull hook in hand an elephant and several camels across Metro North tracks at 5 p.m. on a Friday with no police in sight, then taking these stressed animals into the facility to give rides to children. After submitting evidence, the Danbury Ice Arena in April of 2019 permanently banned traveling acts after witnessing this. Severe confinement, lack of free exercise and the restriction of natural behaviors caused them to suffer, leaving them prone to health, behavioral and psychological problems. I have footage of a male elephant chained for 72 hours under a tarp at the Danbury train station and submitted four days of evidence to a USDA investigator that went unanswered. I've witnessed elephants, camels, kangaroos held in a confined space inside the Naugatuck Office Park. What makes this so distressing to me is that I've seen firsthand what their lives could be like. I have been a volunteer at Wildlife SOS for eight years, a sanctuary in Agra, India, where they have rescued and rehabilitated 600 sloth bears and dozens of elephants. Although they can never be released back into the wild, they roam free on many acres of land with their own kind, living in peace, getting proper exercise, nutrition, enrichment, and on-site vet care. Animals and traveling acts are not as fortunate. And on September 14, 2019, I went into the biggie, saw Beulah, the 56-year-old Asian elephant, laying down, not moving, in a parking lot, behind a busy road with no food or water. I put calls into the biggie, animal control expressing that she was in distress and needed immediate vet care. My fears were concerned, confirmed, and she died 15 hours later after several eyewitnesses saw her collapse, covered with a tarp and taken away in a bucket truck. She was brought to the Big E with her health compromised, although her infection could have been treated. Thank you. Would, to, you, would you please summarize your time has expired? Absolutely. Due to the mobile and transitory nature of traveling acts, law enforcement authorities cannot properly monitor the conditions, nor do they follow up on previous infractions. I have filed numerous complaints with the USDA, Animal Control and DEEP, and all have been non-responsive, whether it be for a lack of resources, transparency, or lack of existing Connecticut laws. In conclusion, I would like to say this. We do not know until the moment we see the world with different eyes that we truly start to understand and internalize what wild animals endure for our pleasures only. We all know that what they are subjected to for human benefit is wrong on all levels. And the solution is to recognize it and change the laws that are currently in place. 
passing HB 5293 is the most cost-effective and efficient way to safeguard both animal welfare and public safety. Thank you thank for your you. time. Well, thank you, Jill. Uh, thank you for your testimony and your uh, perspective. Um, don't see any hands raised in the room for, for questions. So again, uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to uh, share your opinions with us. Excuse that, me, Mr. Gresco, my hand is raised. You're not a participant. Okay, I'm sorry. Yet. Thank you. Moving on, we're gonna to go to our next uh, person. It is uh, Anne Godwa, followed by Alexander uh, Petals. Petals, your choice. Thank you, I'm so early. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Cohen, Representative Gresco, and all the distinguished members of the Environment Committee. My name is Anne Gadwa, and I'm the advocacy and outreach organizer with Sierra Club Connecticut. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on several bills before you today. The Sierra Club is committed to defending everyone's right to a healthy world by tackling the serious challenges of a warming climate, unprecedented levels of pollution, the waste management crisis, biodiversity loss, and the dangers of toxics. To effectively tackle these issues and challenges, we must do more to address them with real solutions. Sierra Club Connecticut supports House Bill 5294 with some recommendations to strengthen the bill. The amount of plastic that contaminates our land and waterways is extremely concerning. It threatens our wildlife and ecosystem and its production is exacerbating the climate crisis. Helium balloons, their strings and ties often end up snaring birds or aquatic wildlife and sometimes get swallowed when animals mistake their latex or foil for food. We recommend a total ban on the release of helium balloons and recommend a public education component at the point of sale to inform consumers about the policy and the responsibilities under the law. Sierra Club supports House Bill 5293 with a recommended language change. The intent of this bill is to prevent non-native animals such as elephants, tigers, giraffes, and lions from being exploited for entertainment and amusement of humans, which we of course fully support. However, we fear the language wild or exotic will open a loophole for animals bred here in captivity. We recommend the terminology non-native, which is unambiguously defined as living or growing in a place that is not the location of its natural occurrence. Sierra Club opposes Senate Bill 244 on several grounds. We fear this bill would open the door to unregulated hunting of wildlife under the guise of protecting um, agriculture and farm animals, particularly um, bears and bobcats we're concerned about. Uh, it could create a public safety hazard due to potential backyard hunting, particularly at night. It would basically allow 24 seven hunting. It's also unnecessary as Deep already has the authority to take problematic wildlife as do farmers. We strongly advocate for proper public education on how to reduce negative interactions with wildlife, such as limiting any sources of food and using all non-lethal means to deal with problematic wildlife before resorting to hunting, particularly for backyard chicken hobbyists and beekeepers, which I am actually. <laughs> Sierra Club appreciates the committee raising a bill that could potentially begin the process of strengthening the EJ law in the state. In updating Connecticut's environmental justice law, the process must include and be driven by people living and working in environmental justice communities. As you know, the majority of polluting facilities in the state are located in EJ communities, polluting the air, land, and water there, and contributing to respiratory diseases, increased risks of cancer, and other health concerns. In our written testimony, we referenced the New Jersey environmental justice law that passed in 2022 with provisions from this law that Connecticut could look to when considering strengthening our own environmental justice law. These include expanding the definition of overburdened communities and identifying facilities that will trigger the law. It also requires the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection to reject any permits that are in already overburdened communities. We thank you for considering our testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, just a quick uh, question by me. The uh, support of 5294 uh, with an amendment, what would that suggestion uh, be for the helium balloons? Oh, and it would be a total ban on the release of helium balloons and a uh, you know public education component in the bill to, to let people know what their uh, rights and responsibilities are under the law. Understood. Thank you, Ann. I don't see other, any other hands raised in the room for questions. So, uh, as you said, you're early today, and uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. You've uh, you got the rest of the Monday to, uh, uh, to to do what you need to do. So, thank you. Excellent. Uh, next is uh, Alexander, and you correct my pronunciation of your last name, please, and followed by uh, Jason Raimundi. 
Um, hello, my name is Alexander Petals. Um, thank you, honorable members of the Environmental Committee. Um, I have two, two bills I'd like to speak to. The first is um, SB number 237. Um, to me, it seems very odd that you would have that, being as or it, you, a lot of official end up dying during transport. It seems to me more logical that we'd either give money to SNAP or WIC or build a park. To be consistently spending millions for people to have this hobby of fishing seems to me a bit odd. Um, the other bill I'd like to speak to is HB 5293. Um, these animals are put in, put in put question, terrible conditions pet, and and this bill would not oppose education. And it, in, in the language, as others have clearly pointed out, it's um, it doesn't oppose educational eff efforts. But what, my concern but that uh, this was raised by the people's point is that are they not properly certified to be teaching about these animals? And that is that the issue was far, as far as some other their um, testimony of opposing the bill. Um, and let's see if this will work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexander. I appreciate the, the time uh, spent uh, waiting to give your testimony. I don't see any hands raised in the room for questions, so we appreciate uh, your, your perspective. Uh, next we have, next we have uh, Jason uh, Raimundi followed by, followed by Scott Smith. Good afternoon. Thank you all for the time to speak today. I appreciate you taking the time to hear everybody's voice. So this is in regard to HB 5293. Uh, I'd like to first start out by saying I'm not uh, opposed to regulations. I'm not anti-regulation. Uh, I think regulations are an important part of the world today. However, I am opposed to blanket regulations that cover large categories uh, with little regard to each independent animal or uh, independent business owner that this could impact. Uh, this is what this regulation is. It goes beyond the traveling circus, as many think that this is what it's about, is elephants and tigers, but the bill is somewhat open-ended. It covers exotic and or wild animals, which can include uh, anything that's not domesticated. So I want to paint a quick picture for everybody, is that uh, you know my love and compassion for all animals in the environment itself came from my friend Seven's birthday. I'm an environmental engineer. This kind of craved or created a path for me to become a professional today. So at my friend's birthday party, uh, educator came, he brought Burmese pythons, ball pythons, a bearded dragon, rose-haired tarantulas, a ferret, guinea pigs, Madagascar hissing cockroaches, everything from what we would consider as local pets to the creepy crawlies that a lot of people have stigmas against. Uh, what this educator did was open my world beyond the rumors and stories that my family and friends had told me as a kid Snakes are slimy, insects are bad, everything is bad. It's gonna hurt you, stay away from it. Uh, they educated me with facts. They allowed me to see animals in the world from a different perspective from the, the fear and folklore that has been told to me growing up. And that really created a passion. If this law is passed or if this bill is passed, uh, we will not be able to have educators such as Curious Creatures or Rainforest Reptile Shows or so many other amazing educators educating the next generation. I just had my son born uh, two and a half weeks ago. I would love to have an educator, if not do it myself at their birthday party, showing them and their friends a different perspective on a, a, an unknown creatures. Now, this isn't elephants and tigers. I can get on board with that, I agree. Uh, there is uh, some mistreatment that occurs with, with a select group of people. The, it, the problem with this bill is it covers a huge category. It is not just elephants and tigers. I think for the most part, we can all agree circus acts in general from, from the mainstream can become somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, inhumane for lack of better terms, but this, this is a, a larger outreach. So these passion educators provided the holistic view that wasn't uh, that these animals are not scary. They didn't just present what's bad about them. They presented them in a beautiful way and helped me understand why we need them, what role they play in the environment and as part of our ecosystem. So without this birthday party, uh, this seemingly simple birthday party, I would not be who I am today. This guided my ethics, my personality, my career path. 
and I've received national awards for my contributions to my industry and the environment. So with this blanket bill, uh, I think the blanket bill itself has very little benefit to the actual impacts that it could have to our economy and our education system within the state of Connecticut. The state of Connecticut already has strong laws, laws and regulations. I, I've heard- Thank you. I'm sorry, your time uh, has expired. Would you please it, summarize? Yes, so just uh, in closing, I urge you to dismiss this bill and focus on enforcement of the current laws which are not being currently enforced. We have great laws and I appreciate you and the time that, uh, I was allowed to speak today. Jason, thank you for uh, your testimony and uh, thank you for the work that you do uh, educating uh, individuals uh, here in the state of Connecticut. Um, and oh, congratulations on the new board. And uh, I don't see any hands raised in the room. So we are gonna go on to the uh, next uh, individual who will testify. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I guess there was a, uh, Mr. Smith, I apologize. There was a mad scramble to uh, people to get their places uh, ahead of you. So we're gonna go now to uh, Christopher Kelly, um, uh, followed by um, Rob LaFrance. Hey, good afternoon, Chairs Cohen and Gresco and members of the Environment Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Christopher Kelly and I'm the Peter B. Cooper Legal Fellow at Save the Sound. I'm here to express Save the Sound support for HB 5297. This bill is necessary for DEEP and the CJAC to identify how they would recommend that we strengthen and amend Connecticut's environmental justice law. The state of Connecticut has signaled its intention to prioritize environmental justice, most notably with the creation of the CJAC and the commissioner's own comments about reviewing and improving deep in its functions. We are most certainly not alone in taking a hard look at whether our policies is advanced environmental justice. President Biden is the first president to repeatedly voice support for environmental justice and other states have recently passed innovative laws which look at how certain communities are overburdened by pollution and create safeguards for them. Save the Sound is among the advocates of pushed for changes to Connecticut's environmental justice law over the past couple of years. That law, as exists, has created an opportunity for disadvantaged residents to raise their concerns and to have a voice. But what it does not do, what the state still does not do, is to consider the existing pollution in the community and the burden that a new or modified facility will create. As Commissioner Dykes mentioned this morning, New Jersey passed a law in 2020 that is considered to be the gold standard of environmental justice laws. It requires New Jersey to deny a permit when it would have a disproportionately negative impact on overburdened communities. That change sounds like common sense. It allows the Department of Environmental Protection to protect communities from pollution. But deep in the Siding Council do not have that explicit authority. We continue to authorize polluting facilities in communities without regard for how additional pollution affects residents or for how many facilities already exist there. Right now, we need to set a goal for adopting this authority. As the commissioner also mentioned this morning, DEEP has contracted to create a database of environmental and health impacts, which will give the state the ability to transparently and effectively consider comparative pollution. My hope is that DEEP will provide the recommendations for how to adopt this authority in a manner which is appropriate to Connecticut and which includes substantial input from residents of environmental justice communities. In addition to that authority, there are other elements of the existing law that DEEP and the CJAC need to address, including reviewing the types of facilities which trigger the law's requirements and the definition of environmental justice community. All of these changes have important implications for the longstanding health of communities around Connecticut and deserve to be worked out in an open process. If we aren't going to adopt revisions to this law right now, then we can at least get a study that considers the needs and capabilities of the state and shows us how we can do better. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Kelly. You have a question from Representative Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly, for testifying with us today. Thank you for all your amazing work on uh, how to legislatively tackle environmental justice issues. Um, just to be clear, would you and Save the Sound support the bill? Would you prefer the bill as is, or would you prefer the bill with CJAC language as well as uh, some language so that we can help deep with that uh, or quote unquote help uh, deep with the permitting process so they can deny a permit and also the refining of the uh, definitions of an affecting facility and um, the definition of environmental justice community. Given that, uh, so the environmental justice law deals with 
permitting and creating and expanding facilities that are sort of by definition of the type of facility going to create some sort of pollution. Anything that happens sooner rather than later, um, as long as you're doing something right, or at least that we all believe is the right way, is the best thing to do. So any changes to the, def to the language in the bill, which create these public processes for amending the bill right now, or better because it means that we can get started sooner and, and hopefully we'll all still involve a public process where deep and advocates and, and everybody else still gets to have their say. Um, but if it remains as just the study, hopefully we're still on that track. It just may take longer because we have to wait for the recommendations and then we start those public processes. Okay, I, I appreciate your answer, yeah. So, yeah, and plus there are the things that worry that I think could be uh, concerning, which is DEEP is going to have less staff, as we know, in the years to come. And I think it emphasizes on the fact that we do need to support uh, DEEP with more funding, better funding for environmental protection and, uh, and environmental uh, uh, justice. Uh, uh, but, um, yeah, I... I I'm worried that this study is, is just, I, I think we already know where our environmental justice communities are, at least to some extent, because we have a map from them. So that establishes the fact that there is a problem and that there are overburdened populations. So what, why not bring, you know, a more effective language right now? Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate your comments and also all the amazing work you did on also drafting language to uh, strengthen uh, the environmental justice statutes. And I sure hope that we can uh, ins like, uh, bring in this language forth uh, um, uh, in, the, in the next steps of the legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative uh, Michelle. And uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly, for your, for your testimony and your patience today. Uh, next, we're going to go to um, Robert LaFrance, followed by Nathan Froehlich. Good afternoon, Chairs Cohen and Gresco, Ranking Members Minor, Minor and Harding, and Vice Chair Slap and Palm. My name is Robert LaFrance, and I am the Policy Director for Audubon, Connecticut. I'm here to talk about three bills today, 5296. 5294, which is the balloon bill, 5296, which is the open space bill. And I'll start with 5297, since we were just talking about it, which is the environmental justice bill. Uh, I just wanna sort of comment on Jack Hennessy's earlier comments, which is um, we did this bill back in 2008. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about how to put it in place. Uh, I think he referred to it as a paper tiger. I would agree with that assessment. However, I think at this juncture, seeing what New Jersey did and what other states have been doing, that there is an opportunity for the state of Connecticut to move forward. I think that we do have some possibilities of way to strengthen the language. However, and I think this is really significant, none of this is going to work if we don't have the staff resources at the department to actually do this type of work. I was very pleased to hear the commissioner talk about different ways she was looking at the impacts, potential impacts in the air sheds surrounding our affected communities, I believe that's really critical information for us to better understand the type of restrictions that we have to be able to support. Things like a, a, a law that would effectively prohibit a new permit from being issued in an overburdened community. I also wanna add something else to the equation here, which I don't think has been talked about in terms of this study, if it only turns out to be a study this year. Beyond looking at the airsheds, I think we also need to look at the quality of life the amount, of, um, the amount of open space, the amount of green space that we have in our urban communities, and thinking about ways that we can improve or enhance that I think are significant. Uh, the department has something called the Non-Target Wildlife Program. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's an area that we might be able to expand to do a better job of reaching out to people in the communities who are in these, uh, are in, are in these overburdened communities to get them to really understand the benefits of environmental protection and the outdoors. Um, the other two bills I want to address quickly, we support the prohibition on the balloon bill. Uh, another colleague of mine will be speaking to that later. And we also support the additional $10 million in open space bonding uh, called for in House Bill number 5296. And I thank you for the time. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you for your testimony. 
and your continued uh, advocacy and of course your your backdrop behind you that uh, uh, is the uh, my district but anyway uh, you have a question from representative Hennessy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so it just seems like th there's a statement that's always being made that DEEP need, D -E -E -P, uh, needs more money. And uh, it just seems like a conundrum that uh, just gets thrown out without any kind of, uh, of, of thought as to how we do that. It, it just seems like you know, we can pass laws and regulations, and if they don't get uh, enforced, then, and, and that seems to be the, the history of uh, Connecticut. Um, so what would you say as to, you know, how, how do we do, how do we create a DEP that actually uh, enforces the job that uh, you know the laws provide. Do you have any comments on that? Thank you, Representative Hennessy. And yes, I do. I, I do think it's a question of priorities. I think that's an issue. I mean, you can take a look at the historic loss in the number of personnel in the state government generally, and we're down about 20% over the last 20 years. And we're gonna to continue to lose personnel in various divisions for, for a number of reasons. Having said that, I think you need to figure out what your priorities are and focus on those priorities. And unfortunately, the department has been given so many priorities, given climate change and other things, it's difficult for them to be able to focus their attention on the issues that they need to address. I think the air quality division at the department is very well suited and has capacity to be able to start to address this issue. I think they have started to look at what some of the issues are with regard to the actual impacts from an air quality perspective. And I am very encouraged that they're gonna to continue to do that work. However, saying that they also need to make certain that they're able to bring these actions in the permit context, which can be quite time consuming. If I'm a permittee or a potential permittee and you're telling me I can't place my business or my, my, my uh, facility at a location, I'm gonna fight you and that's gonna take up resources from the department. I do think the agency is trying to do a better job of getting their legal staff up to speed to be able to try and deal with some of these issues. And I applaud them for trying to do that. Um, the analysis, though, at the, at the base of this, I think, Representative Hennessy, is understanding the real impacts of air quality uh, and what those air sheds really mean. And I do think the agency has a lot of information. They need to do a better job of doing the data analysis associated with that. And it's very complicated because a lot of this stuff is on paper um, and some of it is old. They haven't been able to be in the field in a number of years to deal with it. Um, at the end of the day, it's about focus. I believe that the agency has taken this, I think the administration has taken the idea of environmental justice and is trying to elevate it to the, uh, the, the executive order that was passed. Um, but I do think at some point in time, folks in the General Assembly need to step up and strengthen, I think as you indicated, Jack, this particular law, whether it's right now or whether it's next year, that's a judgment for you folks to make, it is a short session. But my sense of it is the, the expansion of the law, like what happened in New Jersey makes sense. Uh, and recognize it'll take some time to actually implement it, even if you were to pass that law today. Uh, thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer. I, um, you know, we, we had this opportunity last year in the long session to do something, and unfortunately we didn't. Um, I, I mentioned uh, previously that this seems to be an opportunity watershed moment in, in our history to uh, address uh, you know, salient uh, mis misdeeds of the past. And, uh, you know, I, I would hope that uh, Connecticut is able to find the uh, intestinal fortitude to, um, to address these issues. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Chairman. you, Representative Hennessy. Appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Hennessy. You have a question now from Representative Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. La France. Um, actually, I really don't have much of a question, but I'll leave it open for your comments. I'm, I'm going to comment a little bit on, on the extent we just heard before. Um, we, meant, we talked about the money and the understaffing, and given, yeah, the money is a primary issue. If you put into all things that we don't have money to do, then, yeah, it kind of seems uh to go in not not to be very achieving but 
as pointed out earlier in the first hour, there are also places where we spend money that are not for conservation. And we have to, at some point, start thinking of what is more important for the deep to do with a very limited budget. And is it to promote game and fisheries? Or is it to promote conservation? And, you know, as much as a lot of people probably don't like that comparison, I will make it because we, we're talking about the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, so, um, and I know you're very much the organization, you were part of it yourself, uh, but like, like if we're talking about kids getting COPD and asthma and having to leave from districts and from the schools where they could be honest students and, uh, and displace themselves or the family removing themselves from these areas, not being able to go more downtown because it's going to be a lot more expensive than Stanford. Um, but isn't it, primor isn't it crucial to actually find the funding now and take it away from things of less importance that we are spending? And when I see like a demand for $4 million for fish hatcheries and more of it is going to be put into hiring people and we're still not talking about hiring people for conservation. There are a lot of issues. It doesn't make sense. It's contradictory. I hear Deep say, oh, um, you're giving us must work with the uh, circus band. Uh, traveling circus band, but yet we're ready to have more work to do with hatcheries. You know, I think that the priorities need to be redrafted for deep. Frankly, that's my you know personal and and honestly, sometimes we seem to be forgiving to industries that are polluting or or damaging to environment and wildlife versus really focusing on protecting the wildlife. And and there's many examples of that. So I'm just, I'm just, you know, I want to say yes. Maybe we we do need more money to have better enforcement for the environmental for the protection of the environment and wildlife. But maybe there is some money that should not be used for certain other things, and that could be re rerouted that direction. That was my comments. But I leave it open. <laughs> Sorry, Representative. <laughs> I just want to respond on a, on a couple points, and, and I'll try and be brief. Um, I think in terms of of the priorities of the department, there was a bill that passed last year, that was Senate Bill Number Nine Fourteen, where, where it was asked of the department, "What are you going to do? How are you going to deal with your staffing issues, and and what's going to happen with that?" And my sense is that you folks, members of the committee, have seen that report, and you can look at it and figure out what you think is appropriate, what you don't think appropriate in terms of priorities. That's your role in the General Assembly as state government and the legislature and the governor through public acts set the policy for the state of Connecticut, and I think that's your role. And I think you're hearing from advocates who'd like to see it go one way or another. I agree with you. I think that the environmental justice issue is something that's very real. I think it's real in terms of human impact, in terms of air pollution, as you indicated, kids getting COPD or asthma or other issues, that's real. It's happening in our cities all the time. What's also happening in our cities, and I think this is what you're talking about in terms of conservation, is we need more green space. We, meet, we need people to be able to be outside, to be able to take advantage of that, both during, the, both during the winter and during the summer months, to be able to recreate, to be able to do those kinds of other things. The difficulty of environmental justice, particularly as we start to put in a higher standard for a new siting, is that there will be administrative actions, administrative objections, protracted litigation about whether that will or won't work. And I think that is really what we need to focus on in terms of making certain that this law is balanced in such a way, put it on the books and let it kind of let it move forward, but to be thoughtful about that, to have the facts and figures that you need to be able to bring an action in the event that there is an overburden, a community that's being overburdened and a new, a new siting is gonna be bad. You and I have talked about this before, Representative Michelle, it's not only the environmental impact, but it's also the jobs, right? We have jobs and there's a balance between jobs and the environment that we have to deal with. Folks in these communities have felt the, the hard pressure of that, right? The business and industry have pushed too hard those communities can feel it more than others have. So that's the difficulty to find the balance. I can't agree with you more on the jobs. And that's why we have, you know, we're working in offshore wind. We, we, you and I are both part of that commission. And if we do the right thing in, the, in this commission, and if we, the states, the New England states do the right thing, we'll have green jobs. We'll have green jobs for the community that the communities that will be the worst and first impacted by climate change. But we have to do that part. So there's a lot of different pieces. I just don't want to go into another direction with offshore wind. But uh, uh, since you mentioned the jobs, I did want to say we have opportunities and they all need to be raised at the same time, but we need to protect our people. 
We need to protect uh, those families where the children are getting sick. And that needs to happen now. We need to have language that's, you know, very effective. And we have to move funding around, maybe away from the fish hatcheries to protect people, uh, kids from getting COPD and asthma. That would be a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Thank you, Representative Michelle. I just will offer my services to the extent that I could be helpful in any way drafting language moving forward on this bill. Happy to work with folks any, anywhere and everywhere on this issue because it's important to, I think, my organization and to me personally. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Rob. Thank you for your testimony and for your patience today. Uh, next is uh, Nathan Froelich, followed by Lori Vitigliano. Good to be here. Thank you, Senators. Cohen, Minor, Slap, and Representatives Gresco, Harding, and Palm, and all distinguished members of the Environment Committee today for this opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 242 and House Bill 5296. I'm Nathan Froling, Director of External Affairs for the Nature Conservancy in Connecticut. And as I'm sure you've heard me say before, the Nature Conservancy's mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. So first I'd like to comment on Senate Bill 242, establishing a working group on the restoration of eelgrass. Eelgrass is a highly important marine plant species that has been the subject of concern for years as most of the areas where it once lived and thrived in Long Island Sound are gone. It's important both ecologically as habitat and as an indicator of ecological health. And we've been pleased to participate in eelgrass restoration research and management. And most recently that's taken the form of helping to stand up a community-driven project on Fisher's Island to manage and protect the extensive seagrass beds that remain there. So we need to continue working on how best to approach eelgrass restoration in Long Island Sound and the proposed working group can be instrumental in continuing that effort. This group can also intersect with current efforts to address water quality in local embayments where water quality challenges are often greater than in the sound as a whole and also where with shallower water, eelgrass could be more prevalent if environmental conditions were favorable. Secondly, today I wanted to express our support uh, for House Bill 5296. This bill would increase the bond authorization for the Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Grant Program, OSWA, to $10 million. We've been engaged in protecting open space for decades, as I'm sure you know, and the OSWA program has been absolutely vital for our work in conserving thousands of acres in ecologically important places. And this program, as you know, has also been essential to incentivizing and enabling towns and local land trusts to join in active conservation of Connecticut's precious open space. So any improvement in funding for OSWA, including increased statutory clarity about what bond levels are authorized for the program is welcome. We are aware of an important technical fix that is needed in the bill as we understand it. And we believe the fix is consistent with the original intent of the bill. The fix is at the end of line one um, where per annum needs to be added uh, after $10 million. This will help assure that the $10 million limit per year is clear. So thank you, that's all I wanted to say today. I would agree with my colleague, Rob LaFrance on the support for the other bills, including 5294 about the balloons. I just didn't wanna get into that limited time. Thank you. Nathan, thank you for your testimony and uh, for your patience today. I don't see any hands raised in, in the room for questions. So again, uh, thank you, and we're going to move on to um, we're going to move on to Lori Vitigliano, followed by Scott Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gresco, Senator Cohen, Ranking Members Minor and Harding, and members of the Environment Committee. My name is Lori Vitagliano, and I'm from the South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority. I'm here before you in support of House Bill 5296, an act concerning the Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Grant Program. By way of background, the RWA provides approximately 42 million and a half gallons of water per day to consumers in 15 communities in our region. The source of this water is a system of watershed and aquifer areas within 24 municipalities. And much of our 27,000 acres of land is managed for watershed protection, timber resource conservation, wildlife habitat and open space. And the RWA preserves and conserves open space and watershed lands with the help of the Open Space Watershed Land Acquisition Grant Program. We rely on this program to help with our overall goal to protect the water supply. 
This program improves the quality of our drinking water sources by allowing the RWA to acquire open space, and it has contributed to date, we've protected over 1,200 acres in the water district with the support of this program. In addition, this these grants have also made it possible for other land trusts and other similar organizations to protect and purchase open space properties. As a result of the CIA funding, the Oswell program has been able to protect lands that are critical for providing high quality public drinking water to the citizens of Connecticut while lessening the impacts to the water rate payers and Again, we underscore the need to support this program as well as increasing um, the funding level. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And it's a pleasure to see you all. And uh, with that, I conclude my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And um, you touched on a, a point that I wanted to make in that, you know, a lot of um, People will say, well, you know, the open space and uh, acquisition, it, it should be focused more in the urban um, areas and, and uh, rightly so, uh, especially with community gardens. But um, what they fail to realize is that a lot of the um, tracts that are preserved are around watershed areas so that uh, if they are um, not seeing the green space outside of their doors, they are at least a gift of clean drinking water um, as a result of this uh, open space purchase. A am I correct? That is correct. That's one of the components. True. Well, there you go. Uh, I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you, Lori. And uh, we appreciate your uh, testimony and uh, uh, your perspective uh, on this. Um, next, we have uh, Scott Smith, uh, followed by Samantha Packer. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Gresco, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Friends of Animals calls on the Environment Committee to vote down Senate Bill 244. Uh, this reckless, ill-considered legislation threatens to turn the entire state into a 24-7 shooting gallery. Hunting by privately designated permittees could take place during the day or dead at night using spotlights outside of established hunting seasons, on farms, and in any suburban backyard with a chicken coop or uh, hobby beehive. You might as well call this act what goes bang in the night. As an international advocacy organization based in Darien with 6,000 Connecticut members, Friends of Animals views this bill as yet another backdoor attempt to allow the trophy hunting of black bears in our state. Owls, hawks, foxes, raccoons, coyotes, and bobcats will also get a bullseye on them. This proposed legislation is unnecessary because people, uh, particularly farmers in Connecticut, can already generally kill wildlife on their land, subject to certain uh, exceptions. DEEP has, for example, a nuisance bear program, and Section 26.3 gives DEEP the DEEP commissioner authority to, quote, destroy and dispose of wildlife in the interest of wildlife management principles. In the conversation today, uh, I'm hearing this sounds like a DEEP staffing problem, uh, not a bear problem. This bill encourages lethal responses and killing tends to create a cruel cycle of more killing. The shoot first mentality condones ignorant human behavior and asks no accountability of residents who have livestock, poultry, or bees. There's no requirement for electric fencing, motion activated lights, or proper food storage. All too often human behavior is what creates the nuisance and animals pay the price. Study after study shows that interactions with wildlife are best managed through public education about proven practical measures to create peaceful coexistence strategies. These steps offer the added benefit of being long-term solutions to any perceived or potential problems. As with previous attempts to sneak into law an unnecessary and largely unregulated open hunt on predator species, SB 244 is a poorly reasoned bill that exacerbates the problems caused by Deep's overly broad interpretation of laws that benefit trophy hunters and discourage humane responses. Success in minimizing interactions with black bear and other wildlife depends on changing the habits and perceptions of humans, not on more hunting. Senate Bill 244 should be opposed in all forms and guises. Thank you. 
Scott, thank you for your testimony and for your patience. Uh, you know, you were you were on time, but uh, some others that uh, were ahead of you number wise uh, made a mad scramble. So we appreciate your patience. I know it's still light out. I yeah, thank thank you. daylight uh, savings time. Last time it was uh, even night. Uh, uh, I don't see any. Jack, did you want to? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Henderson. Thank you. I, I didn't know I lowered my hand. Um, I just want to comment. Uh, you reminded me when uh, Deep was testifying on this bill, you know, they, they spoke in, in a number of euphemisms about the killing of animals. And I just wanted to point that out, you know, the harvesting, the taking. Um, never was the word killing uh, mentioned, uh, which this bill is all about and expanding it. Um, I think we like to uh, soft shoe the uh, the extent of our complicity in in uh, in this needless uh, activity. Your comments? Uh, well, well said. Um, yes. Uh, the the other phrase I'd like to to abolish is you know we need another tool in the toolbox. Uh, and so often the tool that is in question is obsolete or harmful or or counterproductive. So thank you for your statements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hennessy. I, I don't see any other hands raised in the room, Scott. So appreciate the uh, patience and the, and the testimony. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir. Next, we have uh, Samantha Packer, followed by Amy Patterson. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Gresco, and thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Um, my name is Samantha Packer. I'm an animal science and aquaculture graduate from the University of Rhode Island, and I currently work at the Mystic Aquarium, which is an AZA accredited institution. I'm here to oppose uh, HB 5293. I'm here to represent the younger generation of animal keepers, citizen scientists, and educators. While I believe that this bill certainly has great intent, and we've talked about that, especially with actual circus animals, the wording is detrimental to wildlife education and conservation, as we have discussed, in a sense that it's extremely limiting to who can and cannot participate in wildlife education. As somebody who works in an AZA accredited institution, I know how much work it can be to meet this standard. And that is one of the groups that is exempt from this bill. AZA accreditation requires not only physical and structural demands, but also extremely financial. It's very expensive to become accredited. And I do not believe that this should be a limiting factor with who can and cannot travel with animals for educational purpose, so long as it is done correctly. There are plenty of non-accredited facilities. Oh, I'm very sorry. There's no better way to inspire children and adults then with the proper presentation of a live animal. And I've witnessed this firsthand. Um, I visited many preschools and elementary schools without permitting uh, with my own animals that like I've heard other people say, I treat like my own children. Um, watching children become expired over animal interaction, a very simple interaction, even 20 minutes is pretty incredible. And it is probably the most effective way to get people passionate about these animals and their ecosystems. The passing of this bill would make my actions alone illegal as my animals are considered non-domesticated. I do not do this for financial gain and me and many others do this merely to inspire others to care about our wildlife. Merely having an animal out in front of a crowd would be considered entertainment by the wording of this bill, even if the animals that are well taken care of and the presentation itself is completely educational. In order for this bill to be most effective, I believe a red list must be constructed that is more specific instead of the blanket statements of exotic or wild animal, including but not limiting to, which does include our reptiles and amphibians with that lip, but not limiting to. Um, the wording of this bill would reach to the level as simple as transporting a class pet such as a hamster, because that is considered an exotic animal. Um, and passing this bill would have negative effect on the next generation of water, wildlife conservationists and educators. I do not believe this bill should be completely ignored by any means. However, the wording has been grossly overlooked, especially when it comes to the list of animals included. I do not wanna see animals in circus act. I completely agree with all of you and your stories, but this does include animals, not just the big ones that we're thinking of here. Um, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, don't go anywhere. You have a question from Representative Michelle. But before we do that, um, I just wanted to say to individuals in the attendees room, um, Adam Good and Patricia Harmon to I'll hit the blue button uh, so we can get you into the room uh, because you're, you're coming up. Uh, thank you, Representative Michelle. Go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was just going to uh, 
say that the bill text, I believe, already provides exemption for AZA accredited zoos. Uh, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure where your programs, I think WASA is a, as well, aren't you guys accredited uh, uh, with uh, uh, AZA or WASA? So I don't, I don't think that bill uh, touches your programs. But I think, oh, no. I think the bill does um, provide some information as what we, the state would consider or drafters would consider legitimate. Uh, but I appreciate that and thank you for your testimony and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Michelle, and thank you for your patience, uh, Samantha, and for your testimony. Uh, uh, next, we're going to go to Amy Patterson, followed by, well, we're going to try to get Adam Good in here um, uh, next. Uh, so if you're around, Adam, please hit the blue button. Amy. Thank you, uh, Representative Gresco, Senator Cohn, and distinguished members of the Environment Committee. For the record, I'm Amy Blingmore Patterson and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Land Conservation Council. Thank you for this opportunity to present testimony in strong support of HB 5296. As referenced earlier by my colleague, Eric Hammerling, in addition to wearing my CLCC hat, I'm also here on behalf of the State Open Space Review Board, for which I serve as co-chair along with Eric. I have submitted written testimony on this and uh, 5294. Uh, but I'm going to use my time to respond to some of the excellent questions that were asked earlier by committee members. Uh, to Senator Cohn's question regarding the demand for the program, and this is the Oswa grant program, it is consistently robust. As an example, in 2020, the agency received 37 applications, a record number, with a project total of 25 million, of which 7.5 million was available. This type of shortfall in funding not only prolongs the process due to the significantly higher and unexpected match required to be raised, but it also deters landowners and new applicants from seeking grants out of concern that there will not be sufficient funds in the next round, leaving many exceptional projects on the table. To Representative Dillon's question regarding geographic diversity, as, as Eric mentioned, there is language in the statute which references geographic diversity as a consideration for the program. And that goal, as well as proximity to urban areas, are also criteria that DEEP looks to in scoring OSWA applications. And finally, regarding Representative Bresco's question about the program historically being offered twice a year, per the statute from the program's inception, which was in 1998 to about 2001, the program was offered twice a year. And I remember those days. Um, I handled a lot of those closings. And it's a great question because if we have any chance in meeting the state's goal, ramping up funding and staff of the program coupled with returning to a semi-annual offering of grants would be a huge step in the right direction. And I do wanna mention one other point. All said, with the challenges we have now in meeting state conservation goals, comes an opportunity. There are several federal programs that land trusts and communities may tap into as a source of match funds, particularly for OSWA. And the good news is that existing and new sources of federal funding are expected to increase. So increasing the base funding of OSWA to 10 million a year will put the state in a terrific position to leverage those federal dollars, encourage more land trusts to apply to the program and conserve more land. So as always, thank you for this opportunity and for all you do, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, uh, Amy, and thank you for all of the uh, great work that uh, you do on behalf of the state. Um, I don't see any questions um, uh, or hands raised for you uh, right now, so appreciate the time and, uh, and the perspective. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to Adam Good, followed by, um, well, it should be Patricia Harmon. So, Patricia, you're in the waiting room. Please hit the blue button. Uh, but right now, we're going to go to Adam Good. Adam? There we go. Yeah, hi, Mr. Chairman. It's actually Aaron, Aaron Good. Um, but my, my brother is named Adam, so I, I'm used to being called that. But um, thanks very much to the committee for raising the EJ bill, 5297. Uh, and I very much appreciated Rep. Michelle and Rep. Uh, Hennessy's comments at the beginning of today's proceeding uh, about that bill. I uh, just wanted to add a few comments of my own. A decade uh, ago, I was in the steering committee of the New Haven Environmental Justice Network when the EJ law uh, Public Act 08-94 was first enacted, and I, I believe we were one of the first communities to take advantage of the law uh, in 2010 when PSENG 
wanted to add three new peak boilers at its harbor station power plant uh, in what was and, and remains arguably the most environmentally overburdened census tract in the entire state of Connecticut. And thanks to the EJ law, we were able to ensure uh, that no net increase of harmful air pollution resulted from the harbor station expansion. We were able to negotiate a community benefits agreement that included $500,000 for diesel filters on our garbage trucks and school buses and an install an electrified pier in the port. Um, but over time, uh, the laws become considerably yes, less useful. Many of its uh, original infirmities have been exposed. Uh, last year, there was an effort uh, by a major transfer station in the Annex neighborhood of New Haven to expand its operations and start handling putrescible waste, despite an agreement with New the New Haven Solid Waste Authority that they would never do that. Um, but that the transfer stations are not considered affecting facilities under the law, so that that facility's expansion was permitted, essentially rubber stamped by DEEP, despite overwhelming public opposition uh, because of the lack of authority in EJ statutes or any other statutes to consider cumulative impacts in the area, uh, which already suffers the environmental and health impact of a 500 megawatt power plant, uh, sewage sludge incinerator, the port of New Haven, which is used by oil tankers burning bunker, bunker fuel, uh, gas pipelines, multiple transfer stations, chemical plants, cement batching facilities, two interstate highways, all within the same census tract. So one of the problems here is the definition of EJ community in 22A-20A, which is always a flawed definition. It's become even more flawed in the 15 years since the law passed. This definition has little to do with EJ as it is commonly understood. When I want to identify an EJ community, I go on the website of EPA Region 1 and use their, EPA, their EJ screening and mapping tool, <clears throat> which tells me how many Superfund sites, Title V air permits, underground storage tanks, number of poor air quality days are occurring in that zip code. I'm not going to use a DECD list of distressed municipalities. I'm sure that's useful in many contexts, but not for identifying EJ communities. So under the current definition, New Haven is not considered an EJ community, but e East Haven and Stratford are. Some individual census tracts in New Haven qualify, but not included, for example, as a major public housing complex located next to a highway and a Superfund site uh, and where 25% of the kids have asthma. Uh, I know the committee is currently considering some other bills like SB4 that, that use the EJ community's definition to determine where to target subsidies for e-bikes uh, and electric school buses. And I think that highlights the importance of re-examining the definition and getting it right. So to conclude, you. redefining... Okay, your time is up. Could you please yeah. summarize? Yeah, wrapping up. Redefining EJ communities to take into account cumulative impacts is going in the right direction. It gets you only part of the way there. Many more changes are needed. I hope the new CJAC... Uh, we'll have some great members from New Haven. I hope we can help DEEP come up with recommendations to fix the statute that has the potential to greatly benefit communities like New Haven if it's done right with, for, and by the communities that are actually being most affected. Thank you. Aaron, thank you for your uh, testimony. Don't go anywhere yet. Uh, Representative Michelle has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Aaron, uh, for testifying. I think it's at least, I think you've been at every single of our public hearings. So I just wanted to recommend you for your civic duty. Um, I think you nailed it right, uh, right on with the uh, definitions. It's not only the permitting process, but the definitions that need to be changed. So are you saying that if we tackled language either through SB4 or uh, 5297 on, um, on, um, on the definitions of what an EJ community and what the effective facilities are, you would you would you would even support this bill even more. Is that is that a fair assumption? If, I'll say it again. I'll say it uh, in a better way. My French accent is picking up now. Uh, just um, if the bill that we are looking at today would address the definitions and the permitting, would you support? that version of a bill even more with, that would have more than just a CJAC language. Yeah, I think so. If I understand your question correctly, um, the, you know, you know, it's partly about the definition of EJ communities. It's partly about what are the affecting facilities. I think there are a lot of different kinds of affecting facilities were not included in the original law. I don't know if it's because they, the, those, uh, classes of facilities had better lobbyists or what, but we, you know we, we found that out in the last 15 years. So so that's part of it. Uh, it's it's about increasing the the siting authority. 
you know, it's also about, um, you know, a lot of the original law was about community notification and public participation protocols. I think we know a lot more about the weaknesses and infirmities of that section of the bill. So that all needs to be updated as well. So I, I think, you know, any change is welcome, but, you know, I think that there's a whole roster of changes that, that I'm, I'm hopeful we'll see recommendations about. And, and I hope that CJAC will help to do that. Now, I think, you know, there's also an issue if you're, you're using the current definition of EJ communities to determine who is on the CJAC, uh, you know, I think you have kind of like a hall of mirrors pro problem there. Um, so I would say fixing the definition, that, that, was that would probably be my highest priority. Thank you. And, you know, this is something that we've worked on for a couple of years at changing with a good representative Reyes, who's also good to speak, and uh, represented Hennessy and others. Uh, we've been really trying to update these definitions and also the, uh, not only for the EJ communities, but also for the affecting facilities, as well as increasing the public process and in fixing the permitting. And I think we have language uh, available that takes care of all this. So should we wait until the CJAC um, does their recommendations? Or should we not right away uh, some of the definition changes and so immediately do something? I, I do not disagree with anything you just said. And I would also like to thank uh, Representative Reyes for, for all of his attention to this problem and, and all the work that he's done supporting, promoting environmental justice. He's been a real hero on that issue. Thank you, Mr. Good. There's, Mr. Reyes is next and uh, I, will, I will pass the mic. Thank you so much for everything you're doing, Mr. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Michelle. Uh, Representative Reyes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Aaron, good, thank you. Good to hear your testimony. Quick question, have you submitted written testimony, sir? Um, no, I haven't. I, 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 will, I will do so. As Representative Michelle said, I, I've been trying to, to, uh, to get in on as many hearings as possible, and that's limited my ability to do written testimony given my other responsibilities, but I, I will do so. I, I want to I want to be very uh, very uh, complimentary and and thank you for your testimony here this morning. I you you I believe you hit all the points that we're trying to bring home and uh, we believe that we can tighten up this EJ law uh, a little better. And we're not that far away. We've been chipping away at it. I believe we can do a little bit better. But I want to thank you for your advocacy and uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Representative Reyes. Um, Representative Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank uh, Representative Reyes and uh, Representative Michelle for all the work that they have been doing these last couple of years. Um, 2008 was when it was uh, first passed. Uh, so that's what, uh, 14 years. And in that time, things change. Uh, awareness changes, opportunities uh, present themselves. And you know, I think it's just amazing that we're, we're not taking advantage of that. Can, what would be your impression of why these are not readily embraced by DEEP? Aaron. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the, the question. Um, you know, there's, I, I think partly it is, it does have to do with the staffing issue that's, that's come up today. Uh, there's really there's one person in in deep whose responsibility it is to oversee the environmental justice program, and um, I think that leads to uh, some corners being being cut and some issues not being addressed. And I think that one person may, may be very close to retirement. So, so the, uh, I, I think the resources within the department is 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 a big issue, um, and uh, you know I, I think in New Haven. Um, you know, we, we do have a lot of neighborhoods that just feel like there aren't, they aren't um, included in the decision-making process. They're not, they're not being listened to. Their voices uh, aren't, aren't being heard. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the CJAC, the uh, Equity Advisory Council will, will help in that, in that area. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hennessy uh, uh, and Aaron. Uh, thank you for your testimony. 
Uh, next, we have uh, Bill Lucy, followed by Christina Scourge. All right. Can you hear me? Affirmative. All right. Well, good afternoon to the uh, members of the Environment Committee. Um, my name is Bill Lucy. I'm the Long Island Soundkeeper with Save the Sound. And I'm here today to speak in favor of HB 5294 and SB 242. HB 5294, which would ban the intentional release of balloons is a small but important step towards addressing marine litter. Hawaii and Virginia became the latest states to ban releasing balloons joining California, Florida, and Tennessee, as well as some municipalities in New Jersey and also on Long Island. We have tried to pass this bill as has been mentioned in past sessions, um, and I hope we get it through this time. In my testimony, there's a picture of a lobster that was pulled from a commercial pot. It was completely entangled in a balloon string. And the reason I include, included that is because it's important to remember that most of the time animals are entangled and die in the wild, they aren't observed. How many ospreys are getting entangled that aren't on webcams and how many lobsters are getting entangled before they can crawl into a pot and get their picture taken? Uh, the other issue that has, has been mentioned with balloons is they eventually deflate or break apart in the water. They become coated with a thin layer of algae, which is kind of like salt and pepper to creatures like sea turtles and they consume them. This increases the likelihood that they will get these little bits of mylar rubber in their stomachs. And what happens is they get impacted and they die. This is especially acute down in the Southeast where the data exists. Um, the juvenile uh, turtles are dying within a few weeks to a few months of being born and they're washing back up on the shoreline and they're 80 something percent of them are choked with plastic. Um, we also support SB 242, which would create a working group to look at the current science to try out new methods for restoring eelgrass beds. Eelgrass is a highly productive habitat for fish and wildlife species, and it's mostly been eradicated on Long Island Sound by pollution primarily. As we clean up the waters of the Sound and recreate the conditions where it's habitable for eelgrass to thrive again, we need to understand how to jumpstart populations within this historic range bringing together students, scientists, municipalities, and the shellfishing community creates the right mix to keep these efforts moving. So I just like to thank the committee for being able to share my thoughts. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you for the testimony. Uh, good seeing you again. Uh, don't go anywhere. You have a question from Representative Chafee. Uh, even though you're not on mute, I can't hear you, uh, Brian, uh, Representative Chasey. Maybe. I, I don't know. Can anybody else hear him? No. no. I'm happy to ask my question. If, if, uh, 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 let's uh, uh, go to Senator to Cohen. and um, we'll difficulties. Um, I, Bill, so glad to have you here with us, and uh, thank you for your testimony. I just wondered if you could um, tell us if there's any uh, restoration efforts at all underway uh, with respect to eelgrass and, and what sort of the landscape is there. Yeah, so there are a lot of efforts. Um, most of them have not been successful. The biggest, one of the biggest successes is down in Chesapeake Bay, which involved millions and millions of seeds. Uh, Stony Brook University, the EPA, uh, Cornell Extension um, out in Suffolk County have all been working on this for years. And uh, there had some success, but um, we really need to come up with more of a, let's say, industrialized style of uh, restoring this habitat. Um, and I do know that the University of Connecticut has some expertise as well. So it's our hope to bring together everybody that's working in Long Island Sound, both in New York as well, which isn't part of the bill, and really start experimenting some more and getting a lot more aggressive. 
No, I thanks for that. I saw, you know, when we were when this bill was suggested to us, we, you know, had done some a little bit of initial, you know, research, Google searching to figure out, you know, what is being done. And um, some information came up through the Long Island Town study. And is that is anything going on with that group or not really with respect to eelgrass? Yeah, well, uh, the, the big effort, there's a bass uh, uh, eel grass of Palooza coming up uh, next month, and that's led out of the Boston EPA district. But they have been working on it. Um, there's some work going on with the Shinnecock Nation. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is involved with some efforts out there. Uh, there's some planting areas with Stony Brook. They have their own experimental uh, uh, plots and Cornell Extension as well. So what we did uh, with our group as we went diving for eelgrass seeds out near uh, Fisher's Island. And I'm working with a guy uh, out of New York. He's not affiliated with any organization or university. And he's come up with a technique to actually collect these seeds, glue them to small clams. And then he's welded up a machine that will be able to disperse, uh, you know, 10,000 clams an hour. And preliminary work with this is the clams bury into the muck and they get down to about an inch is using small clams and the, the germination rates look really, really promising. So if that proves out, uh, there's a lot of other factors. You could mount one of these on a boat and just drive and start seeding some of these eelgrass meadows, you know, to the tune of an acre an hour if we all, if we get it, you know, get it uh, scientifically proven. It's not fully vetted yet. Okay, wow, that sounds promising then. All right, thanks, Bill. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we're going to try uh, Representative Chafee again. Uh, Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, there we go. Success. There we go. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Lucy. Thanks for uh, testifying today. Um, I'm just curious, what is like the main driver that's destroying the eel grass? Is there anything in particular? Is it erosion or is it uh, water pollution? <clears throat> well, it, it's both. So eelgrass likes uh, a more of a sandy mix. And so with all the land use changes and development, uh, we've had a lot of sediments come down our streams and you get that black mayonnaise or that real mucky stuff in our in its historic range. That's going to be a real challenge. Um, and then as far as pollution goes, when you have too many nutrients, it's just like planting a garden. You throw too much nitrogen on your um, on your tomatoes, you get all plant, no fruit, same with apple trees. So we have a lot of nitrogen problems. And uh, what also happens with that is you get anoxic conditions and it makes hydrogen sulfide, which can actually get sucked up into the eelgrass and, and will kill it. And then with all the pathogens, there's also a virus that attacks it as well. So when you have poor water quality, um, it's an issue, but Things have been getting better. Connecticut averages four milligrams per liter in nitrogen with the effluent from our sewage plants. And uh, eelgrass can survive in five milligrams or less. So our pollution, we're starting to get a handle on our pollution with all the infrastructure upgrades. So I think in the near future, we're going to start getting areas that have the right mix of clear water, sandy soils, and pollution abatement that we need to go in and fix them. Now, if there's no eelgrass near them, they're never going to restore. So what we're proposing is to hopefully jumpstart those in specific areas and have them grow out from there. Great. Um, were you speaking about the balloon bill in the beginning of your testimony? Yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm, I'm bouncing between meetings. I thought you were right. I didn't want to ask you a question that was irrelevant to what you were speaking on. Um, I, I guess for me with this bill, do you, do you think this is actually going to be effective at solving the problem? Um, you know, because people are still going to have balloons. They're still going to let them go. And I, I don't really know what the enforcement mechanism is going to be behind this. Yeah. And I, I heard uh, Representative Wilson make, make a similar comment. And, and that's true. But I like Katie Dyke's response in that a lot of people will obey the law if they know they're not going to do something. There's always going to be a, a section of folks that are going to be daredevils and like let their balloons go, I guess, you know, bucking the system or whatever. But, you know, a lot of people are picking them up. We see them all the time. And I think by passing this, at least there'll be a group of people that'll be conscious about it. And we should start if it's working. If It's an education component almost, correct? Um, so 
we should start seeing fewer balloons on the water. I mean, it's amazing. When you go out during graduation time, it's just, they're, they're all over the place. So it'll be interesting uh, to see if this passes, if that goes down. But yeah, it's a legitimate concern, but we have to start somewhere. And I think it's a good first step. I'm in favor of it. I mean, I, I recognize it's a huge problem. Um, I used to be an avid backpacker and I've been in the most pristine wilderness you could imagine. And there's balloons caught up in the trees in the middle of national parks. So um, I, I do recognize how horrible these are for the environment. Um, I will be the one to throw the B word out and I think we should just ban these altogether. Um, I know it's probably unpopular word and uh, unpopular position, but um, you know, if we really want to reduce these things from the environment, I think we should get rid of them altogether. And I will leave it at that. Thank you for your testimony and the work you do. Thank you. Yeah. And I would, I would agree with that. I mean, it's really an unnecessary tradition in my opinion, but we, there's a lot of interests and we got to, I guess we got to balance some of those. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative Chafee. Uh, next is uh, Representative Hennessy. Hi, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, further on the uh, bill, the, the balloons. Um, recently, I, I, I understood that there was a, a funeral and you know people had balloons and they released the balloons kind of as a religious uh, ceremony of uh, renewal. And, and I completely you know, understand and sympathize with that, but uh, you know, just to get back to the idea of education being the key to uh, recognizing that this seemingly harmless uh, event is extremely harmful. I just wanted to uh, relate that back in the early 80s, I was a waiter for uh, at TGI Fridays in Boca Raton, Florida. And on Sunday, they had this brunch. And, and back then, TGI's uh, was... Uh, you know, it was a going concern. Um, it was very uh, kind of circus oriented and they would make this arch of red and white balloons that you had to walk through in order to get into the uh, restaurant. And at the end of the uh, brunch, you know, so somebody would just go out and, uh, you know, let the, this huge canopy of, of balloons sail off into the air and, you know, I did that and I always kind of like wondered, like, you know, where are they going? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen to them? They're going to come down. But, you know, I, I wasn't educated at the time. I didn't realize how harmful and detrimental it, it is to aquatic life. And, uh, you know, so, you know, in retrospect, I'm kind of horrified at it. And, uh, you know, I think that it's... It, the most important thing is to educate people to uh, realize that that this isn't a uh, you know a benign thing to do. I mean, just like plastic straws. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, uh, Representative Hennessy. I wouldn't uh, say it was for naught. Uh, maybe um, your your actions in Florida will resulted in the state banning the release of uh, of the balloons so uh, we have to follow the lead of florida and you don't hear that very often um next is uh representative michelle thank you mr chair um i like that 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 take on it um thank you bill for all you're doing as always just a quick question because i'm i'm trying i've been trying to get rid of some phragmites is eelgrass, and I'm not a pro, and I know I have a big picture in my background of eelgrass, but is eelgrass intertidal or is it always underwater? It's always underwater. Uh, you will see it in some places where there are minus tides. It'll be laying on the mud flats, um, but it's, 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 a, it's called a submerged aquatic vegetation, SAV. Okay. Okay. So I was trying to link it maybe with... Uh, just regular like other types of seagrass where like the the war between phragmites and seagrass but i see i'm off subject on this one so i'll 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 drop drop out of this one thank you bill again for all you're doing thank you mr chair thank you uh, thank you. uh representative michelle and uh, bill as always appreciate the expertise thank you uh next we have christina scaringe followed by uh annie hornish 
Good afternoon, Christina Scarange for Animal Defenders International and our many Connecticut supporters urging passage of 5293 with thanks to its sponsors and to the committee for its introduction. ADI has worked on this issue throughout the US and around the world. We've provided you extensive data in our written testimony and we stand ready to answer your questions. ADI knows firsthand what happens to animals in this industry as we've rescued, rehabilitated and rehomed hundreds of animals, including former circus animals. We have campaigned for, drafted, and helped pass similar legislation throughout the US, Europe, and Latin America. And we have assisted governments in transnational rescues of animals seized in violation of these and other trade and trafficking laws. Prevailing science makes clear these animals are inherently unsuited for this business model. One comprehensive study that we sent to you considered the latest science and industry worldwide, concluding that for circus animals, this is no life worth living and that any education and conservation role is marginal and outweighed by the negative impression generated by using wild animals for entertainment, raising concerns that we know little to nothing about how or how many animals are sourced, bred, traded, how they die, or what happens once they're no longer used. Federal oversight is complex and costly, and by the agency's own admission, it's just not working. States often rely upon the mere existence of federal licensure, despite long-standing repeated OIG criticisms of vague directives and ineffective oversight and enforcement. The National Association of Public Health Veterinarians warns that no federal laws address pathogen transmission risk at venues where the public has contact with animals, advising that certain animals should be wholly banned from these settings. Federal oversight does not consider public safety that's left to you and to local first responders, yet local authorities often lack the funding familiarity of facilities to deal with these species. Local law enforcement isn't expecting or trained to handle wild animal escapes. Too often they're surprised to learn that there is no backup plan. Using animals this way teaches us nothing about what it means to be wild. Rather, the science shows these acts perpetuate misconceptions that fuel trade and trafficking and endanger humans, the individual animal and wild populations. The CITES Convention on Trade and Endangered Species adopted a measure proposed by more than 30 African nations to end live elephant trade for this purpose, decrying its detriment to conservation and declaring that the only appropriate and acceptable destination for elephants and the only way to promote their conservation is through in-situ conservation programs in their natural range. True conservation demands that we teach future generations what a wild animal really is, and that is not a plaything or a prop for entertainment or selfie clickbait. This bill text exempts state permitted conservation education outreach, which enables Connecticut, should it decide to do so, to properly distinguish between what is entertainment and what is bona fide conservation education, because federal ex exhibitor licensure does not do so. Banning these acts won't end the circus. The show can go on without exposing citizens to chronically stressed and abused animals. It's time to protect animals and Connecticut families from these cruel and dangerous acts. Thank you. Christina, thank you for the testimony. Um, don't head out just yet. You have a question from Representative Hennessy. Uh, thank you. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, we lost uh, one of our pets, a cat. Um, it was quick, you know, it, one week she was fine. She would uh, hang out on my shoulder when we're doing testimony. Um, and then, and then within two weeks, uh, unfortunately, you know, we had to put her down. She had cancer. And, and the, the takeaway that I want to uh, relate to you is that the, uh, the vet said they mask their pain. You don't know. You can't know what an animal is feeling, th that, that if they're in stress, it's not discernible. Uh, you know, even to a veterinarian, you have to take tests to uh, discern what's going on inside. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that out that, that you know, to, to uh, you know, debate about what is uh, humane and what is not humane uh, in the treatment of animals, we don't know. But we do know that they, they deserve to live in their natural environment and their habitat. And, uh, and so uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm so sorry for your loss, and I could just say that that impacts the problem of enforcement. It's much easier to say, look, that's a tiger and you can't have it, than to get into a battle of the experts over what is humane and what is not humane, what is suffering and what is not suffering. And the 
cruelty is not just the beatings. Um, many of our lions that we have rescued have to undergo extensive dental treatment for the crushed, the crushed injuries to their heads from years of being battered across the face, something that is not typically visible. Um, it is also just the existence in this um, business model. Um, most of the data, all of the data shows that these animals, and they typically break it down as wild and exotic. They don't make distinctions on size, big versus small. They were not, they are not made for these containers. They are not made to be stayed in these small spaces and that results in chronic stress. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hennessy. Next, you have a question from Representative Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Garange. Um, I, I have some questions. I know you're well versed on the bill. There's no questions about it. And so I wanted to ask you if you could, you've heard some of the discussions earlier uh, today on definitions or not on definitions, but use of certain words and on wildlife sanctuary or on species and et cetera and exemptions. Can you, can you, can you address some of those? Because I, I, I know we've talked before and you have quite a uh, really good insight on all this. And if, if you could please get into that. Thank you so much. Sure, I know there was some discussion offline on what a wildlife sanctuary is, and both the federal government under the Captive Wildlife Sanctuary Act and the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, which is um, one of the accrediting um, bodies that was exempted in your bill, um, and is also the gold standard worldwide on what makes a sanctuary a true sanctuary versus something that just decides to call it that. And the, the language in your bill for the definition of a wildlife sanctuary mirrors that language. Um, and then the question with regard to education, Connecticut already has a wildlife rehabilitator program in place, which would enable DEEP to make that distinction between what is conservation education and what is not. And let's be clear, everyone calls themselves education, whether they, Joe Exotic calls himself education, right? So, and the federal licensing scheme for exhibitors, and if you're showing your animals to the public and letting them pet your, your wild animals, then you must take, get a federal um, exhibitor license. But the federal exhibitor licensing scheme does not distinguish between, you know, the most advanced fancy zoo, the highly, most highly accredited zoo, and Joe Exotic, or, the little folk, the person who has a tiger in his backyard and brings cubs um, for educate for so-called education. Then the question becomes, is this appropriate education? And the data, the data does not support the statement that public contact with wild animals encourages conservation. In fact, the data is very clear that public contact with wild animals fuels trade and trafficking. The, the, you, and you can see this on social media. Every time you see um, someone sharing a picture of their tiger selfie or their, um, their finger monkeys, the immediate response is, I want one, right? I, that animal I didn't realize could be a pet and now I want it. And so it fuels trade and trafficking and it perpetuates misperceptions that not only endanger the individual animal, but the humans that are interacting with that animal inappropriately and wild populations, because it stems the trade that is killing these species. Cheetah are a great example. Cheetah are victim primarily to the uh, wealthy status pet trade, right? One in six cheetah die on their journeys, and that is what's killing them. And sharing these um, pictures of, of petting cheetah or showing cheetah on a leash or bringing cheetah to a place um, to educate people about cheetah conservation stimulates the pet trade that is killing them. Thank you. And, you know, um, yeah, it just emphasizes that this bill does not attempt or pretend to attempt to take on a massive exotic pet trade across the country. And maybe that's room for more uh, discussions on, the, on another in the next session. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. This bill is narrowly drafted to address traveling animal acts. Um, the, the retail pet trade isn't even um, licensed uh, under um, the Animal Welfare Act. So this is not about that. Um, 
as far as the definition of exotic and wild animals, it appears to mirror the definition under the federal law. And then you go and delineate certain species. One of the problems with delineating certain species and limiting to that, and ADI would support a finite set if you wanted to make it closed-ended rather than open-ended, but it would need to be comprehensive. And the reason for that is the industry is very malleable. When the elephant ban started coming into fruition in the U.S., we saw a, a marked uptick in the use of kangaroos. When the big cat bans, um, and they tended to focus on tigers, went into effect, we saw a big uptick on bob bobcats and ocelots. So the, the species will be replaced by other species unless the list is somewhat conservation um, comprehensive. And again, the data is very clear. And one of the studies I sent you says this, that if you're gonna put a dividing line and say these are the species that should be banned from these traveling animal acts, um, they do go to the wild and exotic category. And of the 49 nations that have done this, every one of those bans bans wild and exotic animals. Four of them ban all animals, but all 49 ban wild and exotic animals. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, your knowledge and your insight. It's extremely helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Michelle, and uh, thank you uh, again for that uh, testimony, Christina. It was quite enlightening. Um, next, we have uh, Annie Hornish, followed by Thomas Allison. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Co-Chair Cohen, Co-Chair Gresco, Vice Chair Slap, Vice Chair Palm, Ranking Member Minor, Ranking Member Harding, and Honorable Members of the Environment Committee. Uh, I'm Annie Hornish, the Connecticut State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. And on behalf of our Connecticut-based supporters, I'm here to comment on three bills. Uh, first one is to support HB 5294, which prohibits certain balloon releases. Uh, thanks to Representative Haynes and Representative Gresco uh, for their work on this bill this year. And to Representative Mashinsky for uh, her past work laying uh, the groundwork for this important bill. Uh, the second bill is to support HB 5293, which bans the use of certain animals in traveling exhibits with exemptions for, um, uh, with amendment, with exemptions for uh, certain legitimate educational activities. And the third is to oppose Senate Bill 244, uh, an act concerning wildlife that causes damage uh, to livestock, poultry, or bees. Uh, we are part of the Connecticut Coalition uh, to Protect Bears. I've submitted written testimony on all three. I'd like to just make a few short comments on Senate Bill 244, uh, uh, which is a bill that is certain to have negative consequences and cause much unnecessary suffering for our wildlife. This bill is a backdoor way to expand um, uh, unregulated hunting of all wildlife, including bears and bobcats. Uh, it adds more vagueness into a section of statute that is already too vague. Uh, the underlying statute, which is uh, uh, CGS 26-47, has no criteria to define who is a qualified person or what constitutes unreasonable damage. And um, earlier today, we saw a deep um, attorney, I believe she was, suggest that unreasonable is an adjective that provides clarification, but, but it does not. That, that's not a, a clear uh, way uh, to describe damage. Uh, importantly, uh, this bill does nothing to encourage prevention of conflicts, such as public education, uh, removal of attractants, protection of crops and livestock from harm, or aversive conditioning by trained persons, nor is there any mandate to explore humane, non-lethal solutions first. This bill would encourage cycles of killing rather than the humane long-term solutions desired by most Connecticut residents. Lethal responses don't solve the problem. They only offer short-term benefit as uh, it creates cycles of killing um, if preventative measures are not applied. Uh, I also wanna say there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's uh, best practices and management plans that already exist to protect crops and livestock. Bear Wise and Bear Smart are two organizations that are excellent resources. Um, and finally, with uh, Circus Bill 5293, I do agree, we do agree that tightening up the language is necessary. Clearly, the intent of this bill is to apply to certain species already used uh, uh, in traveling circuses. I think everyone seems to agree with the, this intended goal. 
Uh, Commissioner Dykes was concerned that DEEP would have to expand their responsibility and enforcement under uh, 26-55, which applies to the permitting process related to certain reptiles, amphibians, and other animals. Uh, and these animals are really not the intended targets of this bill, so tightening up the language uh, would resolve that, and I think to everyone's satisfaction. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, we have some questions for you. We're going to start with our ranking member, Representative Hardy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Annie, for your testimony today. Um, so you had, you had mentioned uh, that, you know, that this does, the, the, the bill that you're referencing does not provide for alternatives to, um, to, to hunting, essentially, you know, the, the, the bear. Um, but I believe that Deep was, in, in their testimony earlier today, was saying that, that in order to get approved for the permit, uh, there, there has to be a showing that, that you've made attempts uh, to protect your livestock in those particular instances. So is, is that untrue or I'd just like to hear your input on that. Thank you for that question, Representative Harding. Um, uh, it's not, that's not in statute. So um, I, would, I would like to see that in statute at some point that people would need to exhaust humane alternatives before proceeding to lethal measures. Okay, but th thank you for your uh, input. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Harding. Next uh, question from Representative Hennessy. Hello, Annie, nice to see you. Likewise. So you mentioned humane non-lethal responses uh, to events and best practices. Uh, I know in, in uh, working with you in the past, um, in your position, you have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge about uh, alternatives to just shooting an animal. Uh, could, could you uh, speak on that for a moment? Yeah, in many of, that's a great question. Thank you, um, Representative. Um, the usually protecting animals like livestock is vital, proper fencing um, and, uh, you know, aversive conditioning that was brought up earlier at, if needed. And I uh, appreciated Representative Mashinsky's comments about uh, the, the person who wants to start a business with Pirelli and bear dogs. All these are ways to manage, you know, to keep bears away and other wildlife and protect, because we all want to see wildlife, you know, um, livestock protected uh, and people's, you know, pets. Um, but there are the, the problem with lethal methods is that when you kill and don't remove um, what is attracting the animal doing damage, whatever that reason is, usually food, um, a food source, another animal will soon fill that void created from the animal who was killed. And also um, many species, coyotes are notorious for this, uh, have increased fertility and reproduction in response to major killing events. Uh, so when they do a lot of uh, times, they'll have these in other states, these big coyote kills within eight months. One study showed within eight months, that population rebounded right back. And that's just a, net, a compensatory reproduction thing that allows species to, to survive um, those types of events. But, um, but one thing I would like to, to talk about is uh, this bill would also very likely result in orphaned animals. Uh, many of whom won't survive, and a plan should be in place for those animals as well. Uh, in the case of bear cubs, um, they, as, as you know, they spend, cubs usually spend about two years with their mother learning survival skills, uh, which can include avoiding humans. And if they're orphaned, and if they survive, they might not learn um, from their mothers to avoid people, and that could cause even further conflicts. But a question that comes up is, if if killing does occur with this, how would those cubs be managed? Those cubs weren't doing damage. Um, how would DEEP manage that situation? Would they authorize the killing of the cubs? Would they allow them to starve to death? Uh, and to my knowledge, um, DEEP has not certified any facility to take in or orphaned cubs. So that, that could be a real problem um, if, if this gets implemented. That's it. Exactly what uh, my question I was fishing for, uh, because it's, it's not really, uh, you, what is the word? It's not logical. You think that, well, if you shoot something, you're going to uh, remove the, uh, the menace, the harm, 
and what you're saying, and there is actually an exponential uh, reaction to it that goes in the other direction. Yep, and that's it's something why deer populations, you, you know, that that they're the deer populations are managed. Um, you kill a certain amount, and the they know the there's a population that will bounce back. It, it's it 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 adjusts for many reasons. There's less competition for food with the remaining deer, for example higher fertility rates, that population comes back. But with nuisance animals, like uh, uh, another thing to realize too, this statute already exists that allows farmers to manage wildlife causing damage. That's uh, 26-72. That's actually in the trapping statutes. And it allows farmers to kill um, any, you know, not notwithstanding what you just said, I agree with uh, killing not being the solution, but that statute allows farmers to kill any fur-bearing animals except deer that are doing damage to property. So it kind of, um, this bill isn't even necessary. There have been two OLR reports, and I cite that in my testimony, that describe how th that statute is used by farmers um, uh, to address damage to their property. And this bill is, it, it's, this bill, in my opinion, is a bear hunting bill in disguise. It's for hunters, sp specifically trophy hunters. And if you look at line 21, it specifically allows the permit holder to retain the body of the animals. And this, th that's trophy hunting. That creates an incentive uh, to exaggerate conflicts with wildlife for the benefit of being able to participate uh, in a trophy hunt. And, and the reason I, I believe we're seeing all this trickery, say, is that, um, which we saw back in 2019, is because trophy hunting proponents, you know, led by DEEP, know that they do not have public support on this issue. Uh, there was a recent large national study, uh, the American Wildlife Value Study, uh, in which uh, Connecticut's DEEP participated, and it found that DEEP's culture was misaligned with the values of the people of Connecticut. And it also showed that the majority of people want humane coexistent strategies with wildlife. And I do have a link for that in my um, written testimony. I strongly encourage you all to read it. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Good to see you. Thank you, Representative Hennessy. Uh, next, Representative Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, Annie, for your for testifying. Um, and thank you for reminding us uh, in, 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 in a way of the three laws of ecology, which is a law of diversity, right? The strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon the diversity of species within it. The law of interdependence, all species are interdependent with each other. And the law of finite resources, which there are limits to growth and limits to carrying capacity. Um, I, I'll start on my question, I have two questions. The first one would be on 244. And that would be like you mentioned the cycle of killing. Can you expand on this, please? Uh, yeah. Um, the, the I think I think I um, got to part of that uh, in, in answering Representative Hennessy's question. Uh, killing usually creates cycles of killing because you're not removing. Uh, you're just filling. You're going to be filling a void constantly, and we see that with a lot of people who have. Uh, th that doesn't provide resolution to the problem. We saw that with the rodenticide bill too, with some testimonies this year, where some companies, they make money by perpetuating the problem. And in instead of finding solutions that benefit, uh, you know, the, the people who need relief um, from, a, from a nuisance situation, th there's money to be made at that. And in, in this case, it's, it's harm to the environment and we, it, it can be avoided and it should be avoided. Thank you, Annie. And then on 5293, what do you think the impact of the bill will be on deep enforcement? Um, oh, yeah, I think that um, if the language is tightened up, I think they're not going to need to be uh, involved with a, certainly not the statute that was concerning to the commissioner, because that doesn't shouldn't apply. So I think we need to remove the language that says um, the domesticated language there but maybe they included, but not limited to, and just name the species. And, and I understand the comments made by the last speaker, why another species could fill in. I understand that. Um, if there is concern, maybe we can just ensure that that species list is comprehensive to what um, might be used. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for all you do. And, um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Michelle.
Thank you, Representative Michelle and uh, Annie again. Uh, thank you. Next, we're going to move on to Thomas Allison, followed by Phil Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll keep my statement brief um, as my concerns with House Bill 5293 um, greatly reflect the fears that um, other people have reported today. Um, my fear is that this will greatly affect educational pr programs within the state. Um, myself, I am not a wildlife educator, but my drive and passion for conservation was sparked by an educator when I was a child. Um, I really hate to see these opportunities taken away and maybe future conservationists within our state um, opportunities disappear. You weren't kidding, uh, Thomas. We appreciate uh, uh, your comments and uh, your uh, brevity. Um, I don't see any hands raised in the room for questions. So we appreciate your perspective and again, your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, next we have, um, next we have, where did he go? Uh, we had, we had uh, Phil Goss, did he? There he is. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead, Phil. Hello, thank you Committee on Environment members for your time today. I'm here as president of the United States Association of Reptile Keepers or US ARC. We are a 501c6 nonprofit advocacy protecting the freedoms of professional reptile and amphibian keepers. And I'm here today opposing HB 5293 regarding exotic animals. And, and frankly, the misrepresentation and misinformation regarding this bill uh, should be enough to get it uh, thrown out. Uh, we're talking about circuses and animal welfare and animal cruelty at circuses, but due to the very limited number of circuses that are still around, circuses are actually going to be the least impacted entity if this bill passes. This, this goes way beyond circuses. And again, the bill is just being absolutely misrepresented. Uh, even a, a legislator, unfortunately, one of the bill sponsors was, I believe, believe, cited twice that reptiles weren't included in this bill, but the bill very specifically states the definition for exotic or wild animal is any animal that is not, not domesticated. So the only animals that would be excluded from this are dogs, cats, and traditional livestock. Everything else would be included in this bill because it's not limited to the species that are listed. So there is an inclusive list, but that again, this goes well beyond that because it says not limited to in the bill. So, you know, that needs to be made clear very quickly. I do believe the chair pointed that out earlier. Another issue of contention that we've been hearing a lot about is the exempt list. So currently the only exemptions are for AZA accredited zoos, which are large public facilities like Beard Beardsley Zoo, uh, falconry, which obviously is gonna be only people speaking about birds of prey, and then if you're permitted by DEEP, which again, those are gonna be usually specific to native species, you know, dealing specifically with permits from DEEP, everything else is gonna be banned under this bill. And most education is not done by any of those three exemptions. So AZA facilities and zoos do a great job of education, but they're at their facilities. You know, the bulk of education that's being done at classrooms or at public libraries or at scout troops, you know, those are not AZA facilities or any of these other exemptions that are doing that. Just briefly, personally, I've given lots of talks on reptiles at every one of them. I'll, I'll bring some reptiles in, talk about snakes specifically. And at every one of them, someone will come up after that presentation and say, I have this bear of snakes. Can I get close to the animal and learn about it? So programs like that, that aren't by an AZA facility, that are actually given in classrooms to the public, that, that is what helps animals in the wild because you alleviate that shovel being taken to the next snake that that person see because the person actually learned about snakes. So we have to realize the extent that this bill would go if passed. And I know there's legislative intent, but after a bill passes in law, legislators are not out enforcing this. Whatever enforcement agency has to look at the black and white letter of the law and enforce that law. And exactly what I'm telling you is going to happen is how this bill is written. And that's what would be banned if this turns into law. Thank and, you very much, but I'm sorry, sorry your time is expired. Could you summarize? Yep, I'll summarize. So this is an extreme case of collective punishment where there's a few bad actors and everybody is being punished. So again, I just wanted to voice our opposition on HB 5293, and we did also submit written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goss. Um, uh, I just had one quick follow-up question, and uh, if you were hanging out and listening to the testimony, yep. um, you 
one of the people before you said something to the effect that uh, bringing these uh, exotic and uh, wild animals into a classroom, uh, even with the best of intentions as far as education goes, um, spurs on the the desire to get one of those, and it 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 perpetuates the um, uh, uh, importation of a species, and and then we get into a whole invasive. I mean, look what happened in Florida with the with the pythons down there, and now we have a a huge uh, problem. So, um, what's what's the answer to that? Yeah, there's there's lots of answers. So the people that we're representing do a lot of things to actually prevent those problems. So I know it was brought up about finger monkeys and and some other animals. So again, specifically, I'm talking about reptiles and amphibians. But the educators that we work with, if they bring in a big snake, that will actually make people not want that big snake because they will say, you should not get this large piece of species of python. It does not make an appropriate pet. You should get a ball python, which is a small species, three to four foot snake instead of a possibly 13 foot snake or a corn snake. And I know three to four feet sounds big to some people, but you have to realize even Connecticut rat snakes can get five, six, seven feet long. So um, I know the length may sound long, but even some native snakes can get can get very long. So again, it's, it's education. We, if that question arises, you know, they'll dismiss that you should get this large species of snake and get something smaller. And since you're bringing up size, you know, this even applies to little geckos, you know, a three or four inch gecko could not go into a classroom if this bill passed into law or a tree frog or any other species of, of non-domesticated animal. Thank you. Thank you for answering my question, Mr. Goss. Uh, we, yep. oh, you, I have a, well, a question from Representative Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I have more of a comment, so not really a question. Uh, and it was just to to say because I, I've you know I've read plenty of emails that say uh, some legislator misguiding, etc. On language, uh, let's let's make let's let's put it on the record right now that when I responded to one of the emails against this bill, five two nine three, uh, and again this is just a statement, so I'm not asking for any answers, but the comments, uh, the comment I made in the email was that what I considered legitimate education programs, because yeah. in my personal view, there are some education programs that are legitimate and some that are illegitimate. Yeah. I just wanted to put that out on the record just to make sure that, you know, if we receive emails that people know where I was going with my response originally. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Goss, uh, for your patience and for your testimony. Uh, next, we're going to go to Ken Elkins, followed by Diane Lorisella. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the chair, Senator Cohen and Representative Gresco, and the ranking member, Senator Minor and Representative Harding, and all the distinguished members of the Environment Committee for this opportunity today. My name is Ken Elkins. I'm the Community Conservation Manager for Audubon, Connecticut, the State Office for National Audubon Society. Audubon supports HB 5294, an act concerning the intentional release of certain balloons. Written testimony was uh, submitted on this bill on behalf of Audubon by my colleague, Robert LaFrance. We support the prohibition of intentional release of helium balloons as they become hazards for our wildlife, especially birds. Balloons and balloon fragments are the deadliest kinds of marine, marine pollution for seabirds, killing almost one in five birds that ingest a soft plastic. These deaths are largely driven by the ingestion, which the birds swallow those plastics. Another threat is entanglement, when the birds are trapped or strangled by plastic materials. Balloons aren't the largest source of plastic pollution, but they are the most deadly kind of plastic. In a study published in 2019, scientists inspected over 1,700 dead seabirds, and they found that the hard plastics, items like Lego bricks or straws, accounted for 92% of all the plastic ingested by those birds. The soft plastics, including pieces of packaging or rubber or foam in balloon fragments accounted for just 5% of what was found inside those birds, but it represented 42% uh, of those seabird deaths. So if we take it even, uh, even more detailed, the balloon fragments specifically composed only 2% of the ingested plastic, yet the Scientists found that if a bird ingested a balloon or a balloon fragment, it was 32 times more likely to die than if it had ingested any other plastic. The soft rubber items can contort, they can move to get stuck in the bird's digestive system, 
whereas the hard plastic pieces only obstruct if they are like the exactly wrong size or shape in the bird's uh, digestive system. I heard earlier the question if this bird would act, this bill would actually help. And there are many human created threats to birds and other wildlife, but in this case, we have a chance to reduce what we're finding is one of the deadliest threats to birds. So thank you for your time this afternoon and your commitment to our state's environment. Ken, thank you for your uh, testimony and for your patience today. Um, you have a question from Representative Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do again, thank you for speaking today. Uh, I spoke before I asked the question whether it would help. I didn't mean to diminish the bill. Uh, I do think it's a step in the right direction. I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, to your knowledge, are there any sort of, I guess, biodegradable balloons or uh, other materials that break down in the environment on the market? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't looked at all of them. Uh, even many of the helium balloons that are sold, they kind of try and uh, tout that fact that they're better than mylar, but they still take years to degrade. Uh, so I haven't heard of any biodegradable, biodegradable plastics for that yet. All right, thank you. I'll have to do a little bit of research and see if there's uh, some sort of alternative on the market. But uh, thank you for testifying today. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Representative Chafee. Uh, I don't have more hands raised in the room. So, okay, Ken, we appreciate your uh, testimony and uh, your expertise in this. Thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna go to uh, Diane Lorisella, followed by um, our favorite, uh, Jonah Leiper. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I know it's been a long day. Um, dear uh, co-chairs, uh, Senator Cohen and Representative Gresco, vice chairs, ranking members and distinguished members of the Environment Committee. My name is Diane Loricella, and I am an environmental management consultant, a former Connecticut DEEP hazardous waste regulator, and a member of the governor's GC3 Equity and Environmental Justice Working Group. You've had a long day, so I'm going to try to go, th go through very quickly uh, four bills. First is House Bill 5296, the Open Space and Land Acquisition set aside. I just want to make see if there's any chance for a set aside for overburdened and underserved urban communities. Uh, Senate Bill 242 on polluted I, uh, has to do, of course, with eelgrass. And uh, the whole issue is polluted runoff, one of the issues, controlling alternatives with green infrastructure. So I look forward to, I hope that this working group is set up. House Bill 5294, uh, you've had wonderful uh, testimony, including the last person to talk about what happens with mylar and rubber. All I wanted to ask is if you can add in some kind of amendment, the addition of public education components that's often lacking in some of our legislation. But without that, uh, there will be it will it'll be years before this uh, sees the light is effective. My main testimony has to do with support of House Bill 5297 with the amendments about the multiplicity of affecting facilities. During the pandemic, an amazing group of people assembled to with the governor's GC3 working group about environmental equity. This bill is in the, in the right direction. However, I ask this committee to explore the following strategies to strengthen this bill now, not, not in, a, in a year. You have to strengthen the law by bolstering DEEP and Connecticut Siding Council's ability to reject permits now find other ways to do so. Um, also include the ability for DEEP to have uh, enforcement personnel that are trained properly, and there are enough of them. I was one of them back in the 1980s. Legislature, please give DEEP the enforcement funds to do so this year in your budget in appropriations and the governor's bill. Uh, next, add contractor yards with sand piles and truck fleets to the affecting facilities list now. I've been trying for several years to get this one added affecting facility that really makes a difference. Silica dust is a known human carcinogen. When you see those sand piles, if they're not covered or they're not wetted down, anyone living there, no matter whether they be wealthy or poor, could be affected, it triggers asthma. Also include all permit renewals of current affecting facilities. Just adding those few words now, not in a year, would be very helpful. Um, I really feel, lastly, that there should be 
a review of the former distressed communities list. I live in Norwalk and a Norwalk has been taken off of the distressed communities list due to the uh, census track, which was faulty done in the Trump administration. Norwalk and New Haven had several impacted communities removed from the list. I ask that there be given a year or two because these communities didn't just in the snap of a finger, uh, you know, uh, totally fix their air quality and other environmental justice issues. So I ask again um, that you consider my comments. It's been years since 2008, but most recently, the last time you looked at this bill, I thank you for looking at this bill. I'm in support of CJAC, and I lastly just wanted to say that I'm happy to give, um, I'd love to be uh, offer my assistance in case CJAC forms working groups or subcommittees for community members like myself that could offer some help. Thank you for your, thank you for all you're doing in this committee. Uh, please understand um, my comments are due to professional and altruistic um, reasons. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane, and uh, appreciate your uh, persistence and in, in, in getting us to hear your testimony. Uh, I don't see any hands raised in the room as far as questions go. So again, uh, thank you for the testimony and your willingness to serve. Thank you. Uh, and we are going to uh, wrap it up with uh, with uh, Jonah. Jonah. Hi. I'm sorry to disappoint you that I am only Jonah's mom and not Jonah. Ah, so. Jonah's mom. <laughs> He's in school and he left me his testimony in case he wasn't back. Is it okay if I read that? Only if you're as cute as he is. <laughs> I'll try, yeah, but go right it's ahead. All order. <laughs> So good afternoon, Representative Gresco, Senator Cohen, and members of the Environment Committee. My name is Jonah Leeper, and I'm a resident of Simsbury, Connecticut. Today, I'm testifying in favor of raised bill 5296, which would allow use of the state bonds to provide funding for DEEP's open space and watershed acquisition program. Simsbury, the town I live in, is fortunate enough to have plentiful open space owned by the town, state, and local land trust that preserve our natural and historical land trust, including protected ridgelines that are hundreds of millions of years old, a large shallow pond where I have personally witnessed hundreds, if not thousands of migrating geese land in the fall, and tobacco fields where the famous civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. himself worked. However, I know that many towns across the state are not so lucky and development remains one of the greatest threats to wild places across Connecticut, New England, and America as a whole. Many other areas of the state have land of great natural or historical value, whether that means providing habitats for endangered species or preserving colonial era history, that remains unprotected. For this reason, this bill would greatly improve our ability to preserve our heritage and identity as a state. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and please tell Jonah that uh, we appreciate his uh, his willingness to uh, give the testimony and his persistence in making sure that we hear it. You have a question from Representative Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's not a question. It's it's uh, just, I would like to thank you for uh, presenting your son's testimony um, to uh, fight for the environment. Our, our youth today, I mean, they're looking at an unsettled future, and it, it, it behooves your son to be a leader uh, within this effort to, uh, to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hennessy. I'm proud of him, too. And I know he wanted to be here. He's actually at his environmental club meeting right now. Well, tell him that uh, we said uh, <laughs> we're glad you're giving him hell. So uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you uh, everyone uh, for participating in our public uh, hearing today. Uh, that's the end of the uh, list as far as I can see. So uh, for for housekeeping uh, sake, um, we all know that um, as far as uh, legislators go, we're all going to be uh, in the Capitol on Wednesday for our sessions. But as far as our committee goes, uh, we have expect a, 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 a committee meeting on Friday, beginning at 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm sure we will caucus beforehand uh, each of the 
um, uh, individual groups will caucus beforehand and we're shooting for uh, a 10 o'clock start time. So thank you all uh, for participating and, and be happy it's, it's, um, it's light out when we're, we're, we're wrapping up. Um, thank you. Thank you.